Hey, good evening, everybody. We're sorry we're a couple minutes late, but uh, I was starting the interview in the green room before <laughs> the show started. We were having too much fun talking. So, uh, Will Sportasio, uh, welcome to the chat. I'm so glad that you could spend some time with us tonight. Well, well thanks for uh, inviting me in. Uh, I, I love having these conversations, especially in these COVID times, you know? You know, any chance to to, you know, bump up against some real people. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the, we were talking in the green room about the pandemic. And so and that was really kind of where I wanted to start the conversation today was, you know, we're, we're kind of at that three year point where, uh, you know, the pandemic closed everything down here. So in those three years, you, know, you seem to be been fairly busy. I know you had a Kickstarter for Stone uh, about a year, a little over a year ago. And, you know, you, you seem to have kept yourself fairly busy during that time. But what was what was the pandemic like for you? Because you've had some health concerns in the past. So I would assume that there had to have been some apprehension for you, uh, you know, going into that about, uh, you know, what life was going to be like these last three years. Well, um, uh, let me put it in context, um, what I'm about to say. Um, um, uh, it's not really, I've not really talked about it a lot, but in the year 2000, well, 1995 to 2000, I went back to the Philippines. Um, I, I was born in the Philippines, but when I was two years old, I came over here. I'm 59 now, so I, I, I've been here in the U.S. for 57 years, basically my whole life. And um, I, I've only known comics, really, mm. you know, and I've, I, I've never really had a job, job, I actually was a dishwasher once for one day. <laughs> that, you, you knew that wasn't for you right away? Um, my body helped me. I mean, I was washing the dishes and all of a sudden my, my, my hand went like this and I'm going, oh no, what's happening to my arm? <laughs> and I think it was psychosomatic really, but it was almost, it seemed real enough that they go, oh yeah, you better not, you should, yeah, you, you, it's okay if you quit. <laughs> so I well, quit and, and fortunately I'd already been talking to Carl Potts at Marvel at the time already. So, so I got in. So anyways, the context is that um, uh, I've always been working alone, always been working in the bat cave, you know, um, all of his image guys, early 20s, you know, Rob, I think the youngest, I think still in his teens. But we'd always been working in our band cave. And um, uh, uh, in the year 2000, I came back from the Philippines because I went back there five, for five years to try to figure out my other, the other side of, of my psyche. And I came back in 2000 to San Diego and I went into a coma. A diabetic coma. Uh, so I, I I was rushed to Sharp Hospital, which turns out fortunate for me, it was one of the liver kidney, you know, best places sure. for a diabetic to go. And um, to make a long story short, I, I was in a coma for a week. Uh, my blood sugar was 1600, which is like record book, you know, but see, that's why it that's why I dropped off the face of the earth. Actually, another thing people don't know is that week that I went into a coma, um, Bob Harris just arranged for me to to create a new X book. He already got he just got that approved. I, oh. I, was, I was working with uh, Warren right um, on X Force, and then I guess that was the test bed for okay, let's give the you know let's give this image, you know, young Turk. You know, another chance at Marvel, but then I went into coma, and so it, it took years and years uh, for me to get back. But of course, it was harrowing because I went through four bouts of dialysis in that one week. I flatlined once that that week, you know. So I went through a lot, and so and the week before that, I had my I, I had my son, you know. And so, like, it was like, I'm ready to have my life change, you know? Right. Well, you just came back from the Philippines. You, you yeah, kind of spent this five-year period where you were trying to find your, your ancestry. And, uh, and apparently you did so because you were ready to come back and take, uh, take comics by, this, you know, by storm and, and everything. And then this has to happen. I mean, it's an incredible setback for you. Yeah, it was incredible. So, but, but it's interesting thing about the psyche, right? Because I go into a coma and... You don't know you're in a coma. I mean, it's just, it's almost like, you know, you went to sleep, right? And you're, and then you wake up, right? 
Um, uh, I woke up, and since the last thought I had was my my, my son was just born, right? Um, the doc look at looked at me, and I and I go, uh, "Where's my son?" And, and the, you know, my wife came in with with our baby, and I go, uh, uh, "I try to get out of bed," and the doc goes, "No, no, 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 no." And you got you got to try to you got to show me that you could sit up for the whole day, mm-hmm. and then I, I I go no problem, <laughs> couldn't sit up, so <laughs> he, he kept me through paces like that. The next day I sat up. Okay, now I got to see you stand up. Next day I stood up. Okay, now I got to see you walk around the bed. Next day, you know. But my point is, I was only thinking about my son, and being able to care my my new son. Right. Mm-hmm. I. Didn't, I didn't realize that I n- never asked the doctor, what the hell happened to me, doc? You were so Ooh. focused on, you, on your newborn. Believe it or not, I never asked my, my general doctor for two years what happened to me. I was just so focused on my son. So in, in a long meandering way goes to the answer to, to your question where I went through all that and then I couldn't draw. I couldn't be a father right away, but I had to give it the old card college try to 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 get my my strength up to to be the father again, you know, and mm-hmm. then to be the artist again. So I went through a lot of you know stuff, and so and and we work at home, you know. So COVID eh. <laughs> didn't change much. <laughs> Didn't change much. Uh, didn't change much at all. But I had my kids with me. I have three kids now, and and you know my kids were well. They were all in college, but now but they were forced to to be with us. So it, it actually was a little more of a blessing, you know. So it it it, it you know. I, sorry, there's not you know a bad story there, but um, I think a lot of us creatives um have have that kind of uh, experience, had that kind of experience with, with, with COVID because our lives are this, the bat cave here or, you know, a convention. Right. Really, you know, that's true. When, for, when you're self-employed and work from home, I mean, I, like I, I was telling you, we did nothing much changed for uh, my wife and I, when COVID happened either, other than we couldn't interact with our friends as much as we used to, but life at home, it was, uh, was pretty much the same, but uh, okay, well, the thing I, I had a feeling that that was kind of going to be your answer because I knew that you had done a fair amount of work, dur- you know, during the last three years and were staying pretty busy. But, uh, but I think you know, it's it's good to have that perspective. But so, you know, we there's so many things we could talk about, but maybe maybe to kind of go from now that everybody knew about knows about what happened in 2000, it took you a few years before you felt strong enough again, pro- you know, to, to do some work, right? Because, uh, what was it, Stormwatch was really was that like the first thing that you worked on, uh, where you felt strong enough to be able to do a regular book after uh, um, I, I think it was I think um it was uh confidential okay um because I think I I uh I I, I think because that time Walter had already made a transition into uh DC mm-hmm. so this was a, a couple of years after um my coma and um See, the real thing of diabetes is, you know, there's a lot of technical, you know, medical stuff about the blood and, and stuff like that. But really, a, a lot of people and a lot of people have varying degrees of effects of, of diabetes. But the real th- effect really is y- you you lose your stamina. You know, like, um, uh, you know, while Jim Lee and Scott Williams and I were were in an apartment um during the x-men days you know we'd stay up all night every night you know we'd be working 12 16 14 hours a day every day you know and so that was that was just status quo that was just what you what you and, and we were young and dumb we were punks right so we could do that but right after i i i woke up i, I couldn't do that anymore mm-hmm. my brain uh, not to really get into, but it was into because I like analyzing things, and it was really interesting. I've always had a Spock brain. I've always that's why I love science fiction and world building and you know and sciences. 
I love analyzing things. And one thing I realized was that my brain at that point after with diabetes, after the coma, my brain was racing so fast that, and, you know, in nanoseconds, right? So fast that my arm couldn't keep up. Oh, wow. So I'm drawing ahead and, and my brain goes, okay, draw the left curve of the dome. And I go, <laughs> okay, by the time I'm even a quarter of the way through the curve, my brain's going, okay, now do the other side. And then I'm going, you know, and pretty soon, because and because I can visualize, I'm visualizing all that, but I'm not realizing I'm visualizing that in my head, because five minutes later I look down and it it, it scribbles, because my hand couldn't keep up, right. and then and then now trying to write and figure out stories or figure out, you know, character motivations and uh, uh, plot steps, my brain just kept jumping and jumping. You know, I'd start in the beginning where you have to, and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about the ending, but I'm still in the beginning. And so I couldn't put, you know, and, and it took years. That was the thing that really took the longest to be able to slow my, my blood and my brain down so that my physical body could actually keep up. And it was a double edge sword because then because I'd gone through so much physically, I'd also lost 40 pounds in that week wow. that um, my I had to rebuild my body too, not only the knowledge, because it's all just gobbledygook. I had to relearn everything, but then at the same time, rebuild up my body so that I could keep up. And right. you, talk, you talk a lot about your uh your art style and the way you approach illustration is being very gestural. So I would, I, I could see why that would be the, you know, what you're describing as being a really, really big challenge for you, just based on how you approach illustration and the way you, you know, lay out a page that, uh, that thinking ahead is really not where you want to be with that. I mean, I, I, I could see how that could just really mess things up. So it, so it took a, took a year at least to kind of, it, it, it took a couple of years because again, I, it took years to realize it was it was here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you you just instantly think it's just this. Oh, I just lo I lost forty pounds, and so uh, I got to reconnect my nerves and get the muscle memory back. Um, I think it was um, Batman Confidential that I go, okay, yeah, I, I, I could do this. You know, Jim got, got me it because you know because of Wall Street got me into uh, DC, and he go, sure. okay, cool. I went under contract there, and. I go, yeah, I could do this. And in the after the first issue, it was like uh, there were days I would just sit there staring at, at 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 the paper because I'd wake up, get to the desk, and then I'd oh yeah, 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 I want to draw Batman like this. And what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just didn't match my and that's what a professional artist is of years and years of training you're training your your brain to match your your hand mm -hmm. and there was just disconnect there but my brain was going you could do it kid you, you you got it still and and it took years to realize that and so i i had a couple starts and stops because i thought i had it because i for years the gung-ho college try mm -hmm. but then reality and, and your body hits you like a stone wall and got to go back to school basically got to you know got to relearn everything and uh to this day i have um lost my 3d sense you have to be able to see in 3d you have mm -hmm. to be able to realize that so now like art adams i actually will lay out scribble lay out a figure or something but then I'll come in and I'll draw in a horizon and and some vanishing lines just to make sure, okay, uh, uh, the eyes are above the horizons. I got to draw up a, a bit. The mm -hmm. feet are below the, okay, I got, I, 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 I can't do that anymore. I can't just do that in my head anymore. And, and, but you got to be efficient. So I had to take those crutches. I had to, well, I had to overcome the pride. <laughs> And 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 do it um, because again, th that's what you know. That's the real skill that we all have, whether we're writers, colorists, letterers, every anything in comics. We have the worst deadlines in the whole world. 
in any of any commercial field. I mean, I mean, think about it. You know, to do Cameron's Avatar, he had what, ten, seven years, right? At least, it feels we like have, more than that. I have thirty days. And I'm the set production designer, the costume designer. I have to cast everybody. I have to do the storytelling. I have to set up the lights. And then I have to do the key art mm -hmm. all in four weeks. So we have to really rely on our instincts. And so the real frustration in, in the mindset, I, in where my mind jumbled up in the beginning after the coma was that You've seen a lot of people, right? There's that, there's that, there's that, there's that imprinted image in, in non-artists' heads that, oh yeah, it's like, you know, yeah, flaring and, you know, and, and then the scribble slowly starts. Now, if you, if, if you really watch any of us, we get to that basic form right away. Correct. You know? If you see us erasing, it's not because we couldn't figure out how to do the, the arm. It's no this arm no the arm has to be like this you know we're not figuring the arm out we're just going oh no we got to push it a little more we got to push it a little oh okay and if you can't do that you're still an artist but you can't do comic deadlines because you're right. constantly well, well you were saying that you know you, you were you would do uh 18 hours a day sometimes when in the studio with uh with jim and whatnot so yeah that's those are tough uh schedules to, to set yourself to if you're going to meet a 30-day uh, schedule for comics. I mean, that's just, uh, I, 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 I've always wondered how it's possible. I mean, especially when you, with, with the amount of work that uh, goes into it, how, how it's, uh, how, how we're actually able to get such great products out there. I think, you know, is it true for you that, uh, that you could keep working on a page forever, but you, you just know a certain stopping point to, to be able to meet the schedule. You're just like, I have to stop on this page. I'd like to keep working on it, but I have to quit because I have to, I've got a deadline to meet. So do you go through that a lot where you think I could do more, but I'm stopping? Oh, you're never satisfied with anything. But yeah. what you're talking about there is the college brain, right? College art school brain of I'm going to really show everybody. I mean, because you're, you're with your competition day in, day out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and especially if you're a guy, you got, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to really, you know, there's a lot of talk and stuff like that. But when you get into the real workforce, you got to you got to put up or shut up. And one interesting thing I found out in analyzing that, because then I started getting into we all got into, OK, people are asking us advice. People are asking us to tutor them and try to br help them bring them into the industry. And for instance, like something with comp is like composition, right? You know, whenever you talk to people, professionals in other fields, especially. And again, I I I put it in context that we have four weeks, they can have up to four years, right? And they they only will be allowed to do one job. I have to handle like five different jobs, right? So like composition, people talk about the thirds, people talk about golden, talk about triangle, talk about this or that. Well, I got a, about a hundred panels per comic book to do in four weeks. And then, the asshole writer will come in and put word balloons and mess up my composition. Right? <laughs> so I don't have that luxury of perfecting the composition. So it's very interesting to answer your question directly. We actually learned instinctual way. And, and, and again, think about that. The writer will come in and put in word balloons after my, after me. Sure. So I have no, I can't plan for it. Right. I mean, you have a general so, idea of the script and what you think may be needed for those panels, but after the writer comes in, they could change anything. They could add an extra word balloon. Um, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I mean, it's it's got to be agonizing the whole process. No, no, but, see, but see, it's interesting. We the way we we talked about it in image. We we, we called it drawing until it's cool. <laughs> That's when we know we could stop, because we know we have to get onto the next page. Because again, going back to college. It's you You take a week to do something really cool and you're constantly talking about it, you know, and, and then you do it. And then it's like at least three days of soaking up praise, right? Uh -uh. <laughs> you finish that page and no matter how, no matter how, how oogly Scott is about my page or Jim's page, 
I got to pick up the next page <laughs> blank <laughs> and start on the next thing. You know, there's, there's no, there's none of that. So we got to doing drawing until it looked cool. And what that technically really means is, especially in composition, everything is a directional. All background is just a directional. If Batman is doing something important, you want all the directionals to point to him. So you have a mountain, you have an edge of a house, anything. You want that smoke, you want it to point to Batman. If it doesn't, it's pointing somewhere else. And so we figured out if we draw it until it's cool and as many, many elements will point to Batman or wherever we want you to look, no matter if it's, you know, this is an old joke, but, you know, Chris Claremont puts in 20 word balloons, what background and what figures you will see will still point to Batman. So a composition will still exist no matter what the writer and the the, the letterer does. Mm -hmm. And and so it's interesting that we've been able to instinctively condense all these theories, all these things. So the other element there is action. So like if Batman is swinging like this, the action is here. And old school, we would draw a line like that and hash, 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 right? Whoosh, whoosh, you know, right? Oh, yeah. So we found out that if the, if the uh, other elements don't just point to Batman, point to Batman's hand, but goes along with the swing, and that's where Akira lines came in. When we saw that, oh, oh, look, action flow. Now, again, no matter what the writer and the script writer and the letterer does, we still have this semblance of composition mm -hmm. and all our work is still there, the, the important elements of it. So again, with those two elements, we're able to condense composition. So like whenever I do classes on composition, it's a very short class <laughs> <laughs> because it's boiled down to just the essence. And if you think in that way, any of the theories fall into that. Well, uh, let's see. American Discord says in the chat, Wilson gave me uh, advice on my art back in 1990 that I still use today. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that's good. That, but uh, <laughs> you know, that you you were, you were somebody who, uh, you know, you had a very unique style with your panel layouts. I mean, you 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 broke up a panel like nobody else with the jagged lines and just creating havoc with with a page. I mean, it was. Whenever I go back and look at any of your work, whether it's, I see something on Comic Card Fans or I go back and read an old you know, X Men book or something, that's the one thing that I'm always impressed by is that uh, you you like to create this anxiety and this energy just with, within the panel borders themselves. And I always thought that was really uh, unique with with your style and your approach to to layout. I mean, because one of the things that attracts me most to artworks on uh, CAF or whenever I'm browsing and or looking at somebody's portfolio is panel layouts. And it, yeah. I'm more intrigued by a great panel layout than I am by a, a, a fantastic splash page with lots of people battling. I, I love creativity and in, in, in an approach to telling the story through panels. And so and I, I always have felt that you, you've had one of the more unique approaches to just conveying anxiety or energy or, or atmosphere, uh, you know, just through your panel design. It's just something I, I, I see, you know, looking at your current work too. Well, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've learned, I've learned it all aspects of life. It all, all really boils down to psychology where, where you're going at. And I learned composition. Uh, Carl Potts sent me this, uh, these Xeroxes um, when I was in the Pun before Punisher. And I, I, I I'm gonna to have to ask Carl. I, I forget the artist's name, but he was he was this Chinese artist, and he was a panel artist too. But the Chinese are trained in in landscape composition. Mm -hmm. They're they're not they're not stuck in the boxes like we are, you know. Um, so they will open it up, but they won't open it just for the sake of opening up. There's a reason why. Okay, like they look at the curve of that lake. Oh, cool! That we could we could oh, we could instead of drawing the lake water, we could keep the, the 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 shoreline there, and we could use that curve to point at because I'll put the figure right there at the at at the right side, 
you know. So I was shown composition and I learned composition through the illustrative style, mm-hmm. which is just actual work itself. So it, it's not a it's not a box that you're working in. You could work in anything. An illustrator, an illustrator is as asked sometimes uh, work in just that corner there, you know, just work on you know this whole car, you know, draw it, you know, and so that's how I got into it. And then I started um, getting Japanese influence because I was in Hawaii where I grew up, and I was getting all that Japanese influence. And Japanese influence underneath is a box. Like you think about Japanese writing. Well, when Japanese write, they don't just go, okay, this hash goes there about. No, they're thinking, they're imagining this box and it's cut into four corners. And mm-hmm. that hatching, no, that that's in the top second um, uh, uh, box and it's near the bottom corner of that box. So they're imagining a processing. But get that point though. They imagine the box, whereas we draw in the box. You know, they're drawing the state in the box so that it looks like it's organized in a box that you can't see because they Mm -hmm. don't draw the box. And so that's how I got into the. And then because I want I really wanted to get into film before I I didn't originally want to get into comics. It just was the opportunity that was presented to me at at that young time. And in in film, it's all about the visual language, you know. When there's a tense moment, music usually goes up. Sometimes the camera m- movement is kinetic at that point, as opposed to when it's really quiet and then the c- camera isn't kinetic. And so here I was in comics and I'm going, how can I translate some of that? And then I think Todd was the first one to actually do it with his spider mans where he would do a webbed, you know, spaghetti yeah right you're re- yeah exactly no i know exactly what you're talking about so but what part of film were you interested in uh being you know being like the cinematographer uh, uh you know or you weren't sure you were you just no no no, no no I, that, i've always been sure that that's actually okay. one of the things i try to teach my kids you know you, you, you there's no way you can be 100 percent sure what's going to happen in the future but you got to pick something and go with it mm-hmm. and then like me you know i'm going to be akira kurosa i'm going to be david lean and then, okay, UCLA is really expensive. <laughs> and hey, look, my cousin comes along and says, "Hey, I'm going to drag you to Comic Con. What the what the hell's Comic Con?" And then, oh wow, Carl Potts is there. Hey, you want a job? Okay, go with the flow. But I uh, I want to be a director. But okay, but you could be the director if you're going to be the penciler. You know, you That's know. So, so so I, so I stuck at that and. See, I, I, I love the old school, okay? I love Kurosawa because he 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 consciously uses kinetic energy. Um, if his actors don't move, again, kinetic energy, then the background might move. It might rain. Smoke might be going. Or other actors in the background might be moving. He always strive to have some motion somewhere some kinetic energy somewhere david lean he was for me the master of here are your two actors talking and they're the most important because it's clark gable and you know yeah, these, these top scott stars that i'm paying that you know eating up most of my budget so i got to keep them happy but they're in this in this old uh, old school marketplace and so dressing up the background so that it looks like a marketplace, but it looks like those people back there are actually doing something. They're not just pretending they're moving around and to make it fit and then to put it into composition. And then they go back to Kira Kurosawa because Kira Kurosawa would, would frame his, his composition. And then without a cut, he would move them because the actors are moving and then he would stop his camera and the actors and everything else was in a, a predefined set composition without a cut, you know? So I, that's what I ate up whenever I looked at like John Ford, you know, and, 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 uh, um, uh, Citizen Kane and, 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 you know, the Godfathers and all that. I always looked for that. And for me, when I was doing comics, that was the fun part 
you know, and it was kind of, you know, to go back a little bit, it was a kind of a challenge that, okay, the writer is going to arguably kind of mess me up. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a challenge to see if I could then see the final book and, oh, my composition is still kind of there. <laughs> you know, it, it was kind of a challenge, ca challenge to me. But yeah, I, I would always, I, that's how I always thought. I always thought that I'm, uh, 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 I would love to film this, but how do I do that in static images? Right. Well, you know, what you're describing there, it, seems, it sounds like it would have been sort of hard at times to look at your page and say, I, well, I've got I've got a I've got a cool page. I can move on to the next one because there's so many things that you want to tell in that. And in, in yeah, panels that uh, you, you had to be at odds with yourself, you know, from time to time where you're like, there's more I could be doing here, but I can't. And, well, uh, well, see, it, 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 again, it, it's interesting because I've always had this in me that, OK, I, I'm not getting what I originally want, but. This is kind of there, so I'll go with it and, mm -hmm. and make whatever I can of it. Well, that moment happened to me when uh, after uh, Scott, Jim, and Brent Anderson and some other guys in San Diego watched Terminator. And the reason that hit was that it was one of the first times, because if you look at almost all movies now, almost all movies now, if you're coming at it from a comic book perspective, you could say, oh, look, they're doing comics. Mm -hmm. OK, one thing that we have to do is because we have arguably 22 pages back then up to 28 pages back then. Now it's almost a strict 20 pages. That's not a lot of real estate to do a story. That's really basically four condensed scenes. And the scenes have to be condensed. You know, movies can be moments, you know, multiple expressions, multiple reactions. But in a comic, you may basically only have really one. And so one of the tricks to that, one of the hacks to that is to do double plane, where you have your main storyline, two characters talking. And then in the background, now they call them Easter eggs. It's the secondary story continuing. Or the secondary story that was the main story in the page before its conclusion but it's layered mm -hmm. and in terminator that's what cameron did he layered a lot of his action he he foreshadowed he concluded like we did in comics and now if you look at the structure of almost all screenplays today okay we have page one okay the other page is the back of the cover and glossy so that's an ad okay so our first story page is that and so it's opportunity to start to set up or just to give a splash cool right and then that opens up and then us image guys you know it was always it was done before but it wasn't a strict thing but us image guys go oh two pages <laughs> we can do a splash right mm -hmm. and so we started doing that and to, to to and we had to adjust our story structure so you have that first page to start to introduce this, the main element, the main scene that's going to happen in this, in these four um, scenes, in this issue. Open up the two page, two and three, double page spread. Boom. It's the, it's, it's an introduction to, whoa, this is, oh, wow. The Silver Surfer is going to fight the thing. Oh man, cool. And then page four is, two weeks earlier <laughs> and then you do the story but see you've already set up the beginning of the end right and so then th we slowly then got into the to the standard of the last page or two is the cliffhanger for the next issue so that again we've already now preset so we don't have to that pa first page of the next issue doesn't have to be an elaborate setup it can be just a continuation of the pre-setup. And if you look at almost all screenplays now, what is it? Exactly yeah, the same thing. Very, it, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. So, I mean, when you guys were in the studio early on, I mean, before Image and everything, you know, you, you Jim and Scott, for instance, are these things that you guys talked about when you're trying to think of narrative uh, th uh, elements to introduce into your comic books to to, to spice it up, like the a DPS for, for pages two and three? I mean, are those things that you discussed openly or did, did they just kind of happen naturally and 
you, know, you see you see one of, you know maybe Jim do something that you know is you think is interesting or, or vice versa I mean or, or were you having open conversations about it over a drink after work I mean how how, how was that creative process like for you guys especially because you did define the 90s in the way you approached um, comics storytelling uh, you know taking art to just a totally different level than it was in the 80s I mean I'm just I'm just curious kind of what the dynamic was when you guys were in studio you pre pre-image really you just you know when you're really setting yourselves up for what that future was going to be um uh, unfortunately there there's because of the four week deadline there's not much time to to talk things through um uh the only real time that you have to talk things through is at a convention because you're there okay. the weekend. But see, that's even cut up because you're on the floor most of the time. Sure. So it, so it's at night, but then at night sometimes you're drunk, right? <laughs> so it's gobbledygook anyways. Uh -huh. Is know? that why you guys don't get your convention drawings done? Because you're all having the drinks afterwards? Is that that mystery has been solved? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that I, I get you though. That, that's I hear that all the time. That social that the cons are really that opportunity for you to kind of kick back, relax, and uh, enjoy, you know, the the business. Because when you're in that thirty day cycle, that you're not really it, it's not as fun. It's you don't have that opportunity to uh, really commiserate and enjoy the moment. Yeah, no, we're paid for our instincts. Yeah, L like I said, I mean that that puts into context that phrase I, I earlier. Um, uh, brought up that we draw until it's cool. Mm -hmm. We have to follow instinct because, like you, like your question assumed, if we were just artistically looking at it, we'd be there forever on that page. You know, so you, it's not really letting go. It's this is this is th this may sound crass, but let me put in context right after it. This is good enough, but see, good enough is a relative term. Because every single one of us artists that are in the top top tier, right? Mm -hmm. We have our pages and our poses that we re and covers that we really, really pat ourselves on the back for, right? But whenever you when you start doing commissions, it's almost kind of like a slap in the face in, in a weird way, because you're now asked. And, and I'm talking about high-end commission. So, so it's worth it because you're paid a lot. So you give it time. You give sure. it the same time that you would um, with your work. And you could do that. And it could be your latest new style and new thing that you've brought into your style because you discovered this Japanese guy or this other, you know. But the fans are connecting emotionally. You know, I still get, you know, to this day that, you know, you don't draw like you did before. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> or more, of, right? I'm kind of proud that I've kind of grown. <laughs> okay. But see, my point there is that we almost, it, it, uh, we found out at conventions that it was almost to the point where we could do a scribble and, and the fans would be happy. Because it emotionally hit what they remembered and what they attach themselves to us for. Whereas if we do something technically a lot better, it, it's it's like, who's this? <laughs> you know, so, but see, that's how us artists look at it. I put in a lot of blood and sweat and tears on this shot. And so I'm hoping everybody will see it. But most people necessarily don't see it. Mm -hmm. So we had to then learn, okay, this is not perfect, but this is what, what, what people are expecting. This is what the editor will prove, and I don't have to go through a change. I mean, that, that's, that's a real sign of a pro, a top pro, that you never get asked for changes, you know, because, again, you only have four weeks. Right. You know? And, they, don't and wanna, they don't want to ask you for changes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and let me put um, the speed in, into context. A lot of people don't know this, but here we are, uh, you know, in the two strike teams for X-Men, right? So mm -hmm. I'm drawing 281. Jim is drawing X-Men 1, right? I'm halfway through 22 pages, right? And then I get a call from Bob Harris in New York because we're in California. 
in New York and he's going, well, you know, everybody's been looking at the team rosters and uh, there's Wolverine on Jim's team and stuff. And he's really popular right now. He's, he's going to be the template for the future. And, you know, even though you've got the original X-Men on your team, eh, you, you're kind of underpowered. So create a new X-Men. You got two weeks. Hang on. Right. <laughs> Again, I'm drawing <laughs> the second. You're halfway month. through. Right. right. And so I've got to now finish the second half, create Bishop. And then, so I'm now finished with that last page. And I call up Bob because it's two weeks now. And I pitch Bishop. Bob goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Do it. Put him in the next issue. And now I've got to put him into the next issue. You know, that's how quick it is. It's not... Hmm. I've always wanted to. No, it's just, okay, just bam, 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 do it. Put it in there. Half of what you would like to have happen, and then half of what you think the audience would like to have happen. And so what you do there is, oh, I like uh, visually Bishop and the ex and the excess, uh, the, 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 the uniform mm -hmm. was my John Ford days, the blue and the yellow. And that's sure. why the scarf that's why the blue and the yellow right. and, and, and the high, you know, officer boot, riding boots and stuff. It was all Calvary. But I knew that's what I liked. And I knew a lot of people at that point were forgetting the cowboy thing. So how do I make it more? Uh, uh, how can I connect it to a younger, new audience? And so I started thinking space marines. I started thinking, oh, military. Oh, okay, add in all this sci-fi stuff. And we're already doing the cyberpunk stuff. So let me let me merge what I want. So that's not me pondering, oh, wow, I love this Calvary stuff. And I want to do these shots from John Ford, the tie, you know, a ribbon or, or this or, you know. No, it's okay. Here's the start of a thing. Let's make it Calvary, blue and yellow. Okay, how do I now in the next two minutes, how do I make that a little more palatable to a younger audience? Right, let me put some cyberpunk elements in there. And uh, and uh, this was the last element, the Jerry curls, you know. <laughs> and remember, you got to remember, Prince was big back then. Right. You know, Prince didn't really have Jerry curls, but, you know, what's his face? The You know, the you know, the, uh, the I, got, know you, you know, I know who you you're know talking, talking about. about. Yeah, somebody yeah. in the audience will remind us. But uh, so it doesn't sound like, at least initially, that there was a lot of, I mean, you, you had the concept for Bishop, but uh, but you really had, a, you, you then had 30 days to really work work out a lot of this, the story and the backstory for that character too. I mean, you know, <laughs> who, I mean, you know, you know how, how are you doing that? I mean, were you figuring it out yourself? Were you, I mean, I know, isn't Byrne like co as like listed as a co-creator of Bishop technically? I mean, but so how did, how did you fashion something like that when you really had a two minute call that got it all started? I mean, it, the character had to have kind of been percolating somewhere for you. Even though back then I wasn't a huh. professional experienced writer. Yet. Yep. Rick James was the answer. Rick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, but I grew up even before my film aspirations, mm -hmm. even before I discovered film, um, I grew up on science fiction novels and I'm talking old school, Frank Herbert, uh, Asimov, you know, I grew up on the Roberts uh, robot series. I grew up on right. foundation. I grew up on Dune. Okay. Now, one thing I didn't learn till later on was almost all of those big guns they actually were theoretical scientists. So they were really in literary form, testing out their theories, testing out the latest thought on what, how maybe fusion reactor could work or, or how space travel could work and stuff. So it's re it, when they say world building science fiction, that's what really what it is. You first build a world, then you put people in it and then you let them go. Okay. And so what that really meant to me was when I started writing then was a lot of people, and I teach this, a lot of people get caught up in, oh, yeah, I got this. I got this scene that I worked out for something like when I was 12, but, you know, I've molded it and shaped it when I was 18. And, you know, maybe I could put it in. The, well, that's, you know, square peg circle, you know, uh, yeah. you know, you can't write that way. 
because then you compromise your world because you're you're not following the rules. And every all real that's what reality is. Here are the rules. You may not agree to it. You may not even be consciously aware of it. But here are the physics rules of, of this world. And so I took that and put it into writing where whenever those first few days, we're not talking about, oh, wouldn't it be cool to do this? Or wouldn't it be cool because I had this Calvary fetish to, to do some kind of a scarf or something like that? So what would I match it? Let me go through Fashion Magazine, see how if anybody updated the Calvary look. No, it, it was, that was, okay, Calvary look, that's going to be the basis. Bing, you know, Stormwatch, we did it. Uh, uh, foot, football, football pads and armor. Okay, psh, boom. That's it. That's the only thought. Not go. Don't go into the details. Just the big picture. So when we thought of Bishop, and the only guideline I had from Bob Harris was make him as badass as Wolverine. Now I grew up in the military, and so and I, I, I even at that that time I had some friends in the uh, in the SEALs, and none of them are like Wolverine, but they would tell me stories of people that were but they're not with us anymore. You know, that's where that psyche goes. You either destroy yourself or you get yourself destroyed by constantly putting yourself um, in, in the wrong situations. And that's not what a seal does. That's what specs up. They, they, they spock everything. They plan everything. It's all right. common. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, when you talk, when you think about people who put themselves in harm's way, that they 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 wouldn't be like Wolverine. <laughs> they wouldn't, they wouldn't. Be like they wouldn't be like these characters that we all have you know grown to love and love to read about. Uh, in reality, they're almost the exact opposite. They're calculated. Uh, you know, they're, they're they they need to be efficient in everything that they do from the beginning of a of a mission to the end of it. And yeah, we don't tend to see that too often in comics. But, but right? see, it's interesting as a writer, you have to understand both sides. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that's what people think. And then you have to understand what the real reality is. That's why you always have these stories of actors and writers interviewing those real people and finding out what their psyche really is. And a good writer can use that, can draw you along to what you think and then boom, hit you with real reality. And because it's real reality, it's at first a shock that, oh, they're not mucho macho like that, but oh, wow, it fits. This new thing fits because it's real, it's reality. And so when I, that was the only thing I had and, and that was the only thing I could latch onto. And again, that that's how we did things back then. Okay, the only direction is making badass like Wolverine. Okay, I did it. I don't know if you rem you probably remember. Wolverine was the first here, even though we had Batman. Batman never really stepped over the line. You know, mm -hmm. Wolverine always was hinting that, yeah, yeah, Schnick. I mean, that's what Schnick was. You know, he's going to step over the line. And that's how people were reacting. Because people after the Nixon years, after the economy and every and the hostage shaking in Iran and so everybody was hey wait a minute we're number one we're tough you know our old cowboy John Ford Im, John Wayne image and so everybody wanted that back but the only easy way for people to understand it was that psychotic bit because because we are the loner thing and a lot of that is 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 anger pushing us through the energy of anger pushing us through. And so I go, okay, so how do I do that without making him psychotic? And I instantly thought about Conan because I was reading the Conans back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, basically that is Conan is so tough and stuff because he was born on a battlefield, <laughs> you know? And what that told me was he, he was born to the environment and he was born to fit his environment. So I go, okay, what if Bishop was born in a world where he was, he just genetically was made for that world. So it wasn't something that, you know, he's doing it for anger, he's doing it for a loss. He's just, uh, I can survive <laughs> because all my other friends at 14, they all died. <laughs> Because the Sentinels killed them, you know, because they couldn't run fast enough like me and stuff like that. And so that's where it became obvious. Oh, yeah, we got to we got to put him in Days of Future Past. 
because in the X-Men mythos, that is that world. It is the right. Terminator world. Um, and we were already having visual connections with Terminator and 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 Days of Future Past. So I go, what if he's born in there? So I go, oh, that's going to be interesting. He's just born to be Conan. And when you're born to do something, whenever you become like champion of something, it's not that it's easy, but it just feels easy because it's more natural to you. You know, you know, put Bishop or Wolverine in a math class, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going to get really frustrated, but put them in the middle of a fight. They're going to instinctually get through that really easily. So I go, because I always love psychology. So if that's his psychology, that it's that it's easy and you it's easy because you have to, there you have no choice. You either die or you survive. I go, wow. So the green, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. So there's not much time for relationships, uh, you know, after fighting the Sentinels and you go underneath underground like in Terminator and, and everybody's just huddling. But that is the green pasture. It's relationships. So I imagine Bishop going out there and fighting the good fight and going, ha ha, almost, you know, like Johnny Bravo, you know, because it's easy. And then when it's done, it's nighttime, tweet, you know, the old bell, you know, you know, ooh, it's quitting time. So everybody goes underground. And then it's like, dude, the cute girl, she, she's there. What do I say? <laughs> he doesn't know anything about that. Right. But he's got that chance because he is the cool alpha male and he looks it, you know, but, uh, you got to also remember, right after we did Bishop, I did Image. So I really yeah. didn't have much time to actually play with Bishop. And, 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 but that's what I was going to do. I was going to show that in our present world, he is the barbarian. He is the blood's, you know, thirsty, um, 10 times Wolverine. But that's only because of environment. Remember, nurture nature. Um, what he really was, was about, that's why I had that one scene. I was able to put that one scene in where he's in Xavier's office. And, and well, he's in the foyer waiting to, to see Xavier. Mm -hmm. And then he's looking at the photographs of the X-Men that were just dreams in his head in, in Days of Future Past. They were all gone in the original incarnation of Bishop's timeline. They were gone. And then Storm steps in and it's like, oh, Dude, and he's this little boy. He doesn't really know how to talk to her. He doesn't know how to express that. You know, I've idolized you for my, I have so many tactical questions and, and questions of what, you know, what was real and what, you know, but, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, I really wanted to play with that dichotomy, you know, that, uh, and that originally started with, uh, the re my original, the original way I looked at Colossus, I always looked at him as the man boy. That that he um, he looked and felt like a man, but he was just this young kid, and right, everybody was giving, boy. yeah, yeah. But everybody was giving him a pass because he he was just huge, almost like mice and men, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to have scenes where we show that um, Peter Petrov was really intimidated by Bishop because Bishop has no problems being the leader. Bishop has no problems ordering people around. Bishop has no problems talking with women now. Bishop has no problem getting into battle. But even though Colossus could do all that, he doesn't have the experience and confidence yet to do that. And I wanted to play that. But, you know, again, you know, what happened, what happened? We went off the image and... <laughs> right. Well, and, and so is that sort of what uh, has kind of brought you back to you know the X Men Legends thing? I mean, I've read read the first uh, issue, and it seems like you're touching on some of the things that uh, you're talking about here with you know Bishop, maybe you know being a little bit more cognizant of his surroundings in a different way. That you know, there's there's things that it seems like that uh, maybe you're you're exploring that you want have always wanted to kind of touch on and, and and try to understand a little bit more about the character and let people know what you know what your feelings were about bishop as a character is that is that what brought you back to the book yeah that's the only real reason it brought me back to the book because again i mean i'll just um blurt out the the timeline it was okay create bishop end of 281 
Okay, mm -hmm. put them in 282, put them into the splash because we already had most of the story already set up. And then I do, uh, I think, two issues of Bishop, but we're still dealing with the massive story that brought the two teams together, two, two, that split up the X Men into two teams. Right. So we were going back and forth to those stories, right? And then we did Image. And then they go, okay, you could you, you can leave, but you have to do two more issues, but you can't write it. You, 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 you can't be involved in the plot at all. You just got to draw it. And so I, I, I haven't been able to really look at any issues of Bishop's after me. And um, because again, you know, at that point then too, because of how everything went down, there was really no conversation after that. Because remember, I mean, you put it in, in, in great context. Mm -hmm. It was a two minute phone call asking me to create a bishop. And two weeks later, it was another two minute call, phone call for me pitching it. And then Bob saying, go ahead, do it. And then we do it. And then and then we we brief uh, a burn about this, the, the basic story um, pull through. And then he scripts it. And then we do image. And so all of the things that I was planning, all the things of me going back to why it is a blue and gold Calvary, uh, uh, um, um, uh, it, it's inspired by that, or right. why it has to be in days of future past, why um, and who the two guys that died for Bishop in our present. I mean, that's the only reason I put them in there, because... I, you know, one of the writing things is do but not say, right? So I can't have Bishop go, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm badass like Wolverine, but I'm not psychotic. I just come <laughs> from a psychotic world. And so right. the only way to do that visually is, you know, you, it, they're called clone characters. Put in two clone characters and I go, okay, here are two characters like Bishop, like I want to present Bishop as, but what do they do in the story? They're only designed to die for Bishop, to let Bishop escape. If you, it, it's an old military trope. If you really, really are, have connected to your commander, you will die for your commander, you know, because your commander connected you, made you feel important, gave you a place. And so that was the opening statement that they would die for Bishop. So now I don't have to have Bishop or anybody or caption saying, oh, I'm I'm badass, but there's a soft side of me that I'll tell you about later. You know, I uh, visually you have to wonder. And so right. go, uh, being able to go back to, to show that he's not, he's, he's not, because after me, it, it was just built on the, Bishop's character was just, persona was just built on, the, the X-Men's natural reaction to somebody from that kind of a world. Because obviously there's no way they could understand what that world was. There's mm -hmm. no way they could understand that it's even a place called Days of Future Past. Really? Um, and, you know, they could visit it, but they can't really know what it is. You know, and, and, and so that's, it was really my Buck Rogers, basically, you know. And, but we did, I didn't have the time to, to do that, to, to plot all that out. And it was just, okay, you can't write the next issues and okay, bye-bye, go ahead, good luck. And so there was never a conversation after that. Right. On, on what it is. So, so I took this as a challenge to be able to maybe address that. And my only hinder block was that, you know, and Marvel and DC are known for its continuity. And a lot of things happen in the original incarnation, original timeline. Um, uh, we actually, because I don't know if you remember, but we were playing with a cross book thing of the um, Nathan Christopher is cable, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and we'd already introduced cyberpunk, and that's that's what we bolded around that the cable's future and stuff like that. And so um, we actually were playing with the fact that Bishop, even though this is unplanned, him going through the time into the past, and it was an accident, that accident will lead to Bishop 
killing Professor, being the one who killed Professor X in the future. And so that's how we were going to mold bishops going in story, going in, you know, going, going on from there. And we weren't able to do that because then um, what, um, what, what happened was, you know, continuity that the, the intervening decades where you had the, the Summers Rebellion, which basically, he, uh, you know, a, a bit before Bishop's time, mm -hmm. got rid of all the um, Sentinels. <laughs> so I couldn't have Sentinels, but we, it's comics, so we wormed the way into that. So it was me going back to try to address some of the things that I had originally planned, some of the original concepts, but then having to maneuver in what was already set. You know, like, like right. for instance, one of the major things that irked me a lot, because I, because again, I come from science fiction, so I put in things not because it's cool. I put in things because I built that into the world as a rule, and so there's a meaning for it. And so later on, I'm going to explain that. So the M tattoo. It's not what is established at all. Because because what's established in, in, in official continuity right now was when him and Shard were young, they were in a mutant get, ghetto and they were all branded with the mutant M. Uh -uh. Remember, the pool wasn't built yet. It was just a concept. Right. You know, and I go, OK, wouldn't that be cool if not only was he part of uh, 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 Xavier's security forces, but he was the commander of the prison. So he would have say. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was the only way he could make the distinction, because he's a mutant himself, of him, him, his friends going out, is that they're 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 getting rid of the bad guys, the bad mutants, the bad seeds, so that the good mutants could have a chance with humanity. Humanity might have a chance to allay some of their fears that there are good mutants and bad mutants. And so to dis make a distinction, the pool itself set up every new intern was branded with the M. So it was all the prisoners. But a way to me to foreshadow that Bishop isn't just this gung-ho barbarian. He, him and Team Omega put the M on themselves so that every day he could wake up, look in the mirror and say, this is what I did. And then it was always planned that he was going to then shut it down because he, he saw that the pool was being used for the wrong reasons. And that a lot of the people in it were actually innocent. And so that's why he originally decided to shut it down. But what I was going to have then, after that, the team would not get rid of the M. It's just a tattoo. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a future past. There, there must be a machine to take off tattoos, right? But he didn't take it off because... He wanted to remind himself every day how he fucked up, how he almost really destroyed his psyche by going after his own kind. And that was the real original reason, which is why when we we're going to originally draw it, none of the rest of the, the, the force had the M on him. Right. He was the only one and every single mutant had, had it. Which was, again, because this is another interesting thing. Well, how come Fitzroy didn't have it? <laughs> well, his dad is really rich, right? We've already alluded to that. And so there was going to be another story into how rich was his dad, what influence his dad had. And so that's what, other than Shard, that was the other reason why um, Bishop really, really, at gut level, hated Fitzroy. He was a bad mutant allowed to... More, uh, you know, uh, masquerade as a good mutant. I, you know, I, I love your passion for these characters. I mean, obviously they're yours, so it, it's, uh, it just shows. I mean, so do you hope to do more in this, this, uh, you know, with these characters in the future? I mean, do you think that there's possibilities for that, or is it, or is this two story arc that we're going to get? Uh, all we're going to, going to see for a while. And what's the, what do you think the possibilities of uh, exploring that? you know them a bit more you know is there is there any possibility um there's always a possibility but again you know 
um, I've I've slightly gone into it. You know, continuity is a big thing. So um, you're not going to see, you're going to see after this conversation, you're, you're going to be able to see glimpses of this psychology, you know, in, in these two issues. But the psychology has to be tempered, had to be tempered. Well, what I, the the output of the story had to be totally tempered by, you know, what existed, which is, you know, the ghetto, the 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 mutant ghetto that they were, he was born in, uh, the after effects of the summer's rebellion, you know, and um, and and a, a lot of other things that have already happened, and we've only there's so much that happened that we've only got it, we only had the time to go into what would be relevant to these two issues i'm not I, I i i i'm in reality enough to know that if i planned out and got them to approve uh a, an ongoing thing to go really deep dive into there that there'll be all these roadblocks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as i figure out the rest of continuity that went on that happened so the only form it could really um happen in the way i'd be happy is in a non-continent and almost what if, um, because again, well, I, I guess we could do it multiverse, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm pure, pure. I'm a purist enough that even though that would allow me to do exactly what I originally planned, it would be, it would be like rewriting, and, and I really don't believe in rewriting. I believe, like again, like in the science fiction world. Well, these are the rules. This, this is what this is what we're stuck with. So, okay, as a writer, okay. So, how do I get around this? How do I creatively, you know, write get what I want there with these rules and stuff? And that, to me, are for me that those are better stories because you've worked out something that nobody's thinking about because they're just thinking about the rules, and you figure it out a way to go through there. So. Yeah, it could happen. The only other way that I'd be interested is maybe a series of his time in the pool, mm -hmm. like years before the Fitzroy in incident. So it's almost kind of like a procedural. Right. You know, here's them taking on this one. You know, you, you they get the order, like in CSI, you know, they get the order. The, the 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 capture or kill order and the brief and then they go off them and the whole mission is the whole thing is a mission and then i slowly built in that some of these guys that they thought were bad guys were actually not bad guys and if they were only little less gung-ho they might have seen the signs and then slowly that building up into bishop and him realizing and seeing that and then Ending the series with, I've got to, I've got to bring down the pool. It's not what it's, it, it was supposed to be. You know, I like it. I like, I like that a lot. Yeah, you know, we'll, 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 we've been getting a lot of questions, so I mean, maybe <laughs> I'll just throw a few things out there to uh, sidetrack us a little bit. Um, you know, one, one of the thing, one of the questions. I mean, I, let me just, I can, I can a ask it without being specific. I remember. Um, it was uh, this this one here. But basically, they were saying, you know, is there a definitive uh, uh, work of yours? Remember, you, you mentioned earlier about patting yourself on the back when you knew you had done a good issue or a, of, some, of whatever it was. I mean, how many times does that ha does it happen a lot? I mean, and what and oh, do you no. have any books in particular that you you really felt everything about it just came out the way you wanted it to? Um, uh, almost nothing does, because that's that's the other skill set. Mm hmm you know, is, okay, these are the parameters. Now work in it. So as a creative, you should be able to work through any parameter, any roadblock, any hindrance, right? And and a lot of times, like I said earlier, the result is something really interesting that you thought about. But from a pure creative standpoint, you've got these thoughts in here. you got these <laughs> images. you got these concepts in in your head because that that's what uh the only th uh, 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 let me take a little left term just for a little while 
Um, the only thing I will say about AI, and not being specific which AI, right? Mm -hmm. Just in general, the only thing I'll say about AI, and I'm a, I'm a tech kid. I had my I bought my first computer, an Amiga 2000, in the late 80s. Okay. And I was the guy, I was the one with Brian Haberly who figured out how to use Photoshop for comics. Okay. Um, but the thing I'll say uh, uh, about AI is in order to be a real creative and to really write stories and to really create characters, because anybody can write stories, anybody can write, create characters, but will anybody be interested in it? Will anybody be able to connect to them? So you really have to also know your audience. You really have to have had years and years and years of not going to the parties and the football games, not going to the concerts. And even if you went to the concert, watching everybody around you and remembering that girl that, oh, two weeks ago, I saw her really giddy with this one guy. And then a week later, I saw him, saw her like ignoring the guy and the guy being pissed off. And then a week later, I saw them back together, but she was still kind of, you know, I would see that and everybody, normal people would see that and just, oh, it's the pretty girl. But I would see that and remember that. And then through other relationships, try to interpolate what was really happening there and thereby getting into the psyche of things. So AI is being used so much, and again, being a tech guy, AI is being used too much as a shortcut into getting, being creative. Um, you might be shocked to find out that I don't actually watch a lot of superhero movies lately because producers have now understood you make money with superheroes. And Hollywood, as good as it does its job, it really what it really does is here's the trend. Let's keep this trend going. See, look, we uh, Cameron hit us one billion already, and now look, he's got at two billion. Let's let him keep going, you know. <laughs> and so what's been happening now, and this is where I'll defend, you know, some of my idols like Scorsese and 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 Tarantino. Hollywood has always been okay. Here's the trend. We're not going to look. We're going to look at any other story, no matter who you are. It just turns out superheroes. It, the latest trend, but it's making so much money that nothing else is being looked at. And so my point there is, they are now in that hyper mode of, let's do what the audience wants. Now that precludes George Lucas going. What if we, you know, 2001 was great, but it was too serious. What if I did something like a flash gardening, a soap, a soap opera, and make it relatable to kids? Yeah, I have a kid. It starts out as a kid, you know, and it's and he's an orphan because there's a lot of, you know, single family homes now. And and what if the villain is like his dad, long lost dad? And so, so you know, he's thinking in these terms that nobody's thinking about. Nobody in the early 70s to late 70s was thinking, one, science fiction, because everything beyond 2001 was kind of hokey, you know, and kind of mm -hmm. boring and didn't connect the audiences. And then, you know, Jaws, hey, let's do a movie about just the shark. Or what about this ugly alien guy? You know, so what I'm talking about is that's what a real creative role is, to think beyond what the audience wants, because the audience can only want what they know. And they will want to continue what they know, what they love. And you see that everywhere. You know, no story can have an end. Oh, we love Game of Thrones because wow, everybody dies. And so that oh, was great. There was a face that died right in the beginning and stuff. And later on, as we fell in with the characters, fuck, why did you kill that character? <laughs> you know, because it, it, we got attached to those characters. So we wanted them to keep going. But a real writer understands that's not a story. The story has... A beginning, middle, and end. And if it doesn't have that, it just keeps going on and being regurgitated, and nothing new comes out of that. And so, a lot of what AI and the way Hollywood looks at things is 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 pushing that. 
where everybody now thinks they can get on YouTube and explain a movie, explain why George Lucas is an idiot, why Martin doesn't know what the hell he's doing, you know? Mm. It's, it's... Well, everyone is a critic. Yeah. At the end of the day. But everyone's a critic without experience. Right. You know, no, I understand. But, I, but today pushes that you know. Well, it's it's my opinion, so therefore it's it's valid. But I mean, I mean, look at this trend too. You know, Hollywood used to be the birthplace of screenwriters, writers who actually created new whole stories and new whole characters. Now Hollywood is almost ninety percent script doctors, right? Oh, Superman 10 is going to be out, come on, and, and it's going to be used, this superstar, he's going to be Superman. Oh, wow, he's going to be great. Okay, this writer's hired because he wrote this, this screenplay. Well, he screen doctored this screenplay, and then he got, and then two months later, what do we hear? Oh, he quit, and now there's this new guy, new guy going to write the screenplay. Oh, he quit, and, you know, four or five times the writers play through because it's being script doctor because the producers are pushing, oh, well, they did this in Thor, and so we should do that, or we should, you know, or when are we going to allude to that, or when is the chase going to come in? That, that's put in as a joke, but that actually what, that's actually what happens a lot of times, um, especially when, yeah, we might be able to make two billion this time, you know? So let's follow the trend. But see, that's not what creative, at least for me, in my opinion, that's not what creative is for. Creative for is to make that next Star Wars that we're not even thinking about, that next Jaws, that next Aliens. Remember, Aliens came out, and that was a cool, scary thing, but how do you go beyond that? Cameron comes in and goes, well, Aliens, and bring in the right. Space Marines. <laughs> you know, and now we're going, oh, wow, I could now this, oh, wow, this world is crazy now, you know? Right, well, it's not and, too often where films like that or you know, or anything in uh, in popular culture comes around that kind of shocks you. I mean, it's like you're mentioning Jaws. Well, you could say David Lynch's Blue Velvet was something yeah. you didn't know you wanted, uh, but after you saw it, you were like, "Dang, where's this been all my life?" And, yeah, and, uh, and after you saw it, you knew you wanted, but you go, "I don't want." <laughs> I could never, have, right, I could never have dreamt this up on my own, but I'm glad it exists. No, I, I yeah. saw it in the theaters. I mean, that was, yeah. but I remember having to go to like an art cinema to see it. But those are those experiences are rare. I mean, and I, I, like you, Aliens was a was a, an amazing leap from the first movie. You didn't know how they could do better, and yet Cameron had an eye for our, uh, for doing that. I mean, we've mentioned Cameron three times. I mean, he's he's <laughs> clearly somebody. You know, he's he's someone I think you know many of us admire. Of course, we go we all go to see that he see his films. Um, well, you also got to remember he was a comic guy. Yeah. Well, he loved comics. Well, he wanted to do Superman, right? I mean, uh, Spider Man. Or Spider-Man. Uh, well, oh, Spider-Man right. and Marvel kept pushing him to do X-Men first. And that's where the negotiations went off the rack. Ah, uh, see, that's, <laughs> well, what do you, yeah, what are you going to do? Um, a couple other questions here from the audience that came in. Uh, th these two are sort of interrelated. Uh, one from, uh, from Henry asked, uh, growing up, were you aware of guys like Alcala, Chan, Dezuniga, Nino? And were the influences on you? And then Aranga also uh, asked a question really early today. He asked, uh, uh, how do you see your place in influencing the next generation of Filipino artists to come out post 90s? I mean, you know, so how, you know, were, were those earlier? I mean, again, you were you grew up in the States primarily and, you know, you didn't really go back to kind of look at those influences until 95. I mean, but were you were you aware of those uh, those creatives coming out of uh, Philippines and whatnot? And then, you know, and then similarly, I mean, there's there's a lot of artists that uh, continue to come out of the Philippines. And I, I you know, I, I imagine many of them, you know, you, you gotta be on their radar as somebody who they see as an influential person in their lives. Um, the, the first part of the question, um, Nino Nibres on Iron Fist, the magazine, black and white, mm -hmm. um, Alcala and um, Alfredo on, uh, over Big John on Conan. Yeah. Um, they were on everybody's radar, including mine, but there was no, there was no internet. There was no wizard even. So they were just artists. There was no connection that they were Filipino artists. And, um, uh, the big reason for that is, is actually a big psychological social thing about 
being Filipino in the in the United States. Okay, that we can go on for hours and hours. But when I was coming up, Alex Nino was the one I because I was into design. That's why I, I latched on to Japanese culture, the design, the simplicity. The, the condensing down of everything and and that's what Alex's stuff was but it was it was hard to find mm -hmm. you know um that is one of the other detriments for young Filipino aspiring artists is even to this day is that there are it's hard to find a collection of any of those guys any that's of those great. guys you know so it's hard to get exposed to them and so unfortunately I only got to meet them you know, as you know, like Ernie went uh, two years or three years before Ernie Chan passed away, mm -hmm. about four years before um, Tony Dezaniga passed away. You know, um, I got to meet uh, um, Alex Nino, but he was, I didn't know this at the time, but with Ernie Chan and Tony, they were the three Comancheros because mm -hmm. they both came to the US together at the same time. And so, um both ernie and tony dying within a year of each other really hit 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 uh alex H and he's only now really coming i mean matt i mean his stuff floors me i mean he's like 80 or something and yeah. he, he he just i mean he just you know squirts stuff out <laughs> you know he he can still do that but see to go really to their question um uh even though they weren't conscious influences, because again, I didn't identify them as Filipino. I, I even barely identified myself as Filipino, okay? At that point, it was only until the 30s. Um, but it is interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now feeling there really is something to DNA, um, some memory in DNA, not just familiar DNA but even cultural DNA, because there are a lot of visual, especially with Alex Nino, but even with all the others, you know, Ernie and Tony and Alcala, we yeah. all have the same shadow sense. We all have the same, um, you know, our hatches might be different, but it all comes from the same place. And we all started our color um, um, uh, travel with, here's a basic crayon set now do something with it you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the detriment the contrast for today is you get open up photoshop as your first pass in the color and open up that color wheel and it's 2.7 million so it's not just okay which red i mean i only had two reds in my first batch you know right and so i i was stuck with that and so it was i couldn't complain it was just okay where can i use this red where is it most effective when I use this other red and stuff like that? So I had to, we, we all had to learn. And in the Philippines, those guys grew up in what, what I call um, um, industrial retail. You know, when you go to the, you know, the, the Home Depot or something, mm -hmm. you know, imagine before there was this massive Home Depot, they were these little shops, right? We, we, you, you probably remember some of those on the street corner. And they had one blue, one yellow, one red, right? And you see mm -hmm. that in the architecture around, in the houses around. You know, everything has those same colors. And they had to learn how to make those colors work. And so it is, it's interesting that even though there wasn't any direct um, connection and direct conscious study on my part for them, we seem to genetically follow the same pathway. And so my trip to the Philippines, 1995 to 2000, was not just to learn the language and to try to learn what my history was and whether I could take anything from that history and culturally. I mean, because that's what I do in comics, right? It's yeah. make believe. It's, it's, it's heroes elevating up to superhero, right? And so uh, not only did I went there to, to study that, but I remember... Um, uh, I was there. Everybody knew who I was. I, I was, I go, what? Everybody knows who, who I am. And I'm invited to TV shows, radio shows, meet this movie star, that movie star, invited on this t movie set and blah, blah, blah. And then all these young guys. And one of them was the Neil. 
one of them was a guy named Budget Tan who who wrote Tresse, which mm -hmm. is the first animated Netflix Filipino show. Yes. And then there was Jerry Alangilan who became my first art director in the studio that we built there. And he was an architect. Made, well, he actually was a professional architect. He already did, um, built a couple build. Well, designed a couple buildings. But he always wanted to be a comic book writer and artist and inker. And so he was my first pick into the studio. And it was because I was at a signing, opening up this store in this posh area in in the Philippines called Makati. And Jerry was there as one of the guys trying to get close to me. And he already met me at that time so it was easy for me to talk to him i go hey jerry how, how you doing and he goes and then he looked around he's a very pragmatic guy he, he looked around and I, I knew there he was a writer he looked around and he goes well so i don't know if you noticed this but you have you're having a big effect on all of us by just being here and i'm going uh, and then he explained he goes we have all these groups called Alamut, and there it, it's a conglomerate of all, it's an umbrella of all these other smaller indie, indie groups, and they all want to do superhero American comics, and they're all trying to do that. But this is the Dale of dial-up, right? Mm -hmm. 90s. And, and you couldn't easily get a visa anywhere in the world from the Philippines. So they were already set in, there's no way we're going to get in American comics. There's no pathway. So I arrive, and I'm not that much older than they are. I'm wearing the same fashions as they are. I'm talking the same way. I'm interested in the same um, pop culture stuff because the Philippines is, is a sponge for pop, American pop culture. And so they look at me and they go, if he can do that, I can do that. So just me being there and not being this old fogey, but being somebody that they, they they could envision themselves. Now they could see that there might be. And so they kept trying to, I, I was only going to be there for like two months. I stayed there for five years. And part of the reason was they pulled me in, the, in there. They showed me their work. They said, please, please help us. And I was in this space where I was getting kind of like bogged down by the real reason we missed our deadline is that here we are drawing our first issues and now, oh, uh, Hannah Barbera wants to talk. Oh, uh, 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 toys want to talk. Oh, uh, uh, movies want to talk. Oh, uh, you know, and, and we're just kids, just kids. But hey, Spike Lee just called. Oh, man, we, we got to put our right foot forward somehow. We got to we got to figure this out, you know. And, you know, you went to our first convention. I, I, I went to our first image convention at San Diego where um, Youngblood and Spawn 1 just came out. Mm -hmm. And everybody was asking, even me and everybody else, when's the animation coming out? When are the toys coming out? We, we haven't even, that's the real reason why we expanded the studio. Right. There's no way we were going to take on this load. And we knew the next step was, what's the next book? What's the next book? Because you got to beat Marvel, you got to beat DC. They have hundreds of books, and so understanding now, I was this symbol in the Philippines, and kind of like being buried a little bit by that. I mean, I just wanted to draw and do tech stuff. I was I was the George Lucas. I was you know, I'm going to build a studio. I love tech. I love computers. I'm going to make computers work for comics that going to the film is and finding that that was like oh wow i could build a studio my own studio now and brian haverland came in and then made the connection with wildstorm dc and said hey they want to they want to outsource producing books where well, they would give us a budget for a book and then i i just do it hmm. and then brian would take it and handle all of the posts on it and so whatever we made is whatever we made off of the budget you know and so I stayed in the Philippines and brought in all these guys and brought in the lineal use and because I was now the old, the, this new pathway, this new golden bridge to the United States. And we solved the problems of dial-up. Um, those are technical file things, but me and Brian figured out how to send mm -hmm. um, high-end files through dial-up. 
and boom, we, we have our industry now. And I got to find my other pathway as a, as a teacher, as a nurturer, as an identifier of talent and just fell in love with building the studio because even our studios back here um, in the image, early image days, it's what really skyrocketed. I mean, uh, a microcosm before that was Jim, Scott and I in an apartment together where to go back to one of your other questions, we didn't sit down talking everything out. We visually challenged each other. So there was a place called Mitsu, a big department, Japanese department uh, grocery store, but it just opened a bookstore inside of it. And so every Tuesday they would get these books from art books from Europe and Japan. And we'd see all this manga stuff and so we would go there, gobble up those books, and that's what we. Appleseed was the germination of cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. We got the Appleseed mangas and go, yeah. and we made cyberpunk in the X Men, um, based on that. So, what really happened was that Jim would do a splash page, and Scott would go because Scott's a collector. Even back then, he had high end collection. Even back then, he would then go. Dude, that's so cool, Jim. And and they go over it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because of this. And yeah, that's why I did this. You know? And then I'm sitting there going, yeah, well, I got a two-page spread now. <laughs> and <laughs> the whole thing was, without saying it, they have Scott drawn over to my table to have that conversation about this two-page spread. And then Scott would hear that. I mean, Jim would hear that. And then he would, and then slowly what Jim would learn from the books and things that were influencing him, and I would learn from me, I would see in what he did and pull out. So like we both brought in cyberpunk. I brought in fashion. Jim brought in an organic outline of spaceships. Um, we both brought in technical tech of, of guns. Because that was a time where air one-on-one -on -one airsofts were brought. So we bought all these one-on-one -on -one sized replicas of all these guns so that they, we had a basis of that. And then we just added on and extrapolated on, on all that stuff. That's why our, we were known for our weapons, because they seemed to work. Because underneath it all, like in Aliens, right, it's a Tommy gun. It's a Thompson. The, 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 the you know, the, the count, the, the, the Space Marine gun with the counter on it. Right. And inside that is a Thompson. Mm -hmm. That's why could have the flash because one of the Thompson's things was it put out this huge flash. So right. you put wooden bullets into it. Boom! Whoa! Cool! You know. <laughs> uh, and so we under we understood another because both Jim and I are very analytical. He's an Ivy League guy, you know, and I'm just a science fiction analytical guy. So we never sat down and shared our thoughts we drew our thoughts and then oh yeah okay we just absorbed each other and right and then again and again and then if that caught in with other people then then yeah okay slightly at home you pat yourself on the back <laughs> other people are doing this stuff well i think i think it's uh you know because i know that you know when image started you were the holdout on creating a studio for, you know whereas the other guys did and I think it's interesting that it took that trip to the Philippines to find a find a purpose and uh, and kind of a mission and that, you know, and, and helping, you know, exp, uh, you know, gain awareness for a lot of these young creatives that were over there and and starting the studio is what really got that going. And I think and, and, and I didn't really realize as well that, you know, that I mean, obviously, at that time, like you said, everything was dial up. You're faced with that challenge of how do you how can you work remotely that far away? But, uh, but I mean, I think it's, it's uh, very impressive that that was something that you looked at as something that you wanted to tackle and resolve. I mean, and, you know, especially someone, again, you were, you were just going back there to kind of find your roots and, and understand it a little bit about yourselves. And you found, and a, a, you, you found this great purpose for yourself while you were there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great story. I, and one that I w wasn't aware of. I'm, I'm just, uh, well, well, here's the front it. end, here's the front end to that story. When we started Image, um prior to image was i don't know if you remember homage studios mm -hmm. yeah okay so it was just jim scott and i in an apartment right um 
I think Mark at the time was still at his house and Rob at his house and Todd um, up north in his house. And then we decide, we formed image and we decided to do the studios. Now, by that time, we had already opened up the formal homage studios. The, the, the original homage studios was just the apartment with the three of us. Then right at the beginning of image, when we made the decision to form a studio, then it became, I don't know if you remember, this hub umbrella that encompassed Top Cow. Mark came down from Malibu to live in San Diego to join the studio. So he brought his people to Homage Studios. We, we had this huge corner of a building. And then um, Jim started bringing some people in. I, Jim and I, before that, were already bringing people in. I brought in Chido. Um, he brought in, I think he brought in uh, Heisler letter and some other people and then and then my sisters and my brother-in-law came in as staff and then jim i then i think he's still met he had no he first he, it was his wife his first wife and, and then it was john Nee. and so when the decision was to everybody's doing their individual studios jim and i looked at each other as i guess from a eastern point of view and we go well we're both in San Diego and we've got parts of studios already. And if we individually set up a studio, we'd actually be cannibalizing homage studios right. because Mar Mark would obviously branch off by himself. And so we, th we were always in that power mode thing. So we go, okay, well, the two Asian guys get together and we've already got the makings of the studio. We just now need a, uh, a, a production head really. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then do a talent search for, for, for the next year of artists. And so we decided to, to just join up. So I was the original art director because I was the guy again, while we were in the official homage studios, that's when I met Broderick Haberlin, because that's who the technical guy that Mark brought in before he formed Top Cow. And we were both eggheads, me and Brian. And so not only did we play the first games like, you know, Riven and, you know, stuff like that, mm -hmm. we um, were the first ones to figure out, oh, we could do use this Photoshop thing, but nobody had figured out how to use it. For comics and then john knee the manager at the time his sister clydeen who runs artist alley at san diego had this um negative cutter shop so and it could take a digital file so if we output a fi digital file from photoshop she could take it and run and make a negative and that's what we could send to cubicore mm -hmm. and, and so we had it all figured out. now it was just okay how do we do this and how do we train people to color this because Chido and everybody, they were real painters. Oh, All Joe's that, amazing. They were right? real people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I figured out, okay, well, let's have Chido just do uh, on Xeroxes, which is how we read, how blue lines originally were done. If you remember blue lines, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you know, and so the, a paint, a real painter would actually paint on that. And then that would be scanned. And then the black plate would be scanned separately and then dropped on top. That's how the original graphic novels were done. So we got figured out, okay, what if we get Chai, higher China just to do all of the color guides in this way for all the books? Now we don't have to teach the new colorist color theory. We don't have to go hunt through art colleges to find people that actually know about color theory. They can learn on the job by using Chido's guides to learn color on the job and just basically digital. So we could have Chido totally non-digital and our new staff totally digital. And they would, and the best of them like Sinclair would quickly work themselves up into an actual, would sponge all the information they can of color off of Chido and then be Wait. the top tier. You're schooling me tonight. I mean, a couple of guys have, put, have reminded me because I always say Chiodo. I didn't know it was Chido. Oh, so. um, uh, <laughs> he, that is the real pronunciation. Which one? Um, Chiodo. 
Tildo. Okay. Yeah, All right. It's original okay. Italian, but see, he tells me the old, you know, Ellis Island story. Mm -hmm. You know, when he, when his dad came over, they they said, "What?" Chai, chai? And he go, and they changed it to Chido. All right. No, <laughs> hey, I I I'm, I'm terrible at names anyway. But uh, <laughs> yes, everybody in the in the uh, chat who's caught me uh, butchering Joe's last name for years now. Uh, um. Yeah, let's see. We I have had a few other questions here. One one of the questions uh, the gentleman asked a couple times. So this was from Knights of Old. Wanted to note if you if uh, you love the Voltus V anime like many from the Philippines. Um, yeah, and um, uh, see, um, I don't know if you, you probably don't know, but I'm not familiar with it. Okay, Voltus V was one of the '60s '70s. Um, I, over here we had Mazinger Z. You know the, the big robots that. You know, there would be separate spaceships, and they would, you know, the arm would come in, and the legs would come in, and form yeah, the big. I got one over. I, I got a Megazord over there. Yeah, there you go. Okay, <laughs> so that was a big thing in the Philippines. Okay. And um, uh, right now, um, that's Toei. That's Toei. Um, Toei has um, given the official rights for the Philippine. Um, film industry to produce a new live action um, of that. I personally know the director because the year before COVID, because um, I've I'd be I'd be in the Philippines two or three times every year. Um, I I was in the Philippines and I think it was like my last day and he asked for an, a quick emergency friendly meeting. And so uh, me and a producer friend of mine, we went to meet him and he showed me on this, on the phone, 10 minutes of CGI of Voltus V. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and, and again, this was a year before COVID. He showed me that same image. And just to really quickly, just really quickly do the start. Um, the mother company that he was working for was the second biggest company, entertainment company in the Philippines called GMA. They had already had a relationship with Toei. And so they uh, direct Mark. Mark is the guy, the director. His favorite was Voltus V from when he was growing up. So when, when his mother company connected with Toei, he goes, hey, maybe we could negotiate with them, try to get the rights to do Voltus V, um, a new version, because they hadn't done it. They hadn't done a new one in like 20 years. And so they go over there and the talks go nowhere because it's about money, right? Is the Philippines going to pay for it? Oh, we don't have that much money. Is Japan going to pay, pay for it? I don't know. You know, it's a franchise that's not been going anywhere. So nothing happened. And so Mark, cool young guy, young Turk, he goes off, finds a CGI company, and he does and funds 10 minutes. <laughs> they show that to Toei and they sign the contract instantly. Okay. And so for the last years, He's in production. COVID starts. Oh, shit. So slows production down. But it's going to be released this year. And all of the trailers that they've released in the beginning of the year, there's this mega five-minute trailer. You could you could find it on YouTube. Just okay. type Voltus 5. I will. And here's Japan's reaction to it. Is it going to be shown in the in Japan? Because it's all it's a Philippine only thing. And the quality of the CGI, and this is CGI that was done again the year before COVID. <laughs> That's how good the, the CGI was. But right. the reaction for our J Japanese was um, if it, it, I don't know if you know anything about Toei, but even the common riders and the Ultramans and the Godzillas and stuff, they don't really use the the, the new technology to its fullest realism. They still like the old template of, you know, Godzilla stomping over an obvious toy Tokyo. Right, exactly. Right? So what the Philippine CGI one is real life. It's it's like top end. So even the movies for Kamen Rider and Ultraman and Godzilla don't have that realism and don't have that CGI budget. And so the, re the, the Japanese reaction is not only when is it going to be shown in Japan, but this looks like how a actual movie franchise of, of Toei should be done. Okay. So that's what it, what's going to come out um, this year. And um, I was one of the first ones he, he, he showed at, showed at too. And 
and try to and I helped him as much as I could to get him to get him to the right people and uh, you know and but he's just this young Turk he, he's just got it done and so I think it's not gonna hit the total standards of of us thing because again this is going to be the first thing that's that's really right. out there and they're going to be hampered by um Japan Toei wanting to keep it look looking TV but he does his nice trick he's he's learned from JJ Abrams bloom flares mm -hmm. and he's employed flares properly so that he can fully light a scene but it doesn't have that blaring video look of just stark lights and stuff so anyways it, it's going to be this great thing and yeah it's it's about these i think six five robots that get together and it's all it's all filipino cast all filipino cgi all filipino production and um i'm now a patriotic filipino you know um at the same time still american and still phil american but um i i'm really proud that you know um uh they're working their way up there because like as you've pointed out earlier with alex and and tony mm -hmm. and stuff there's always been top filipino creatives i mean like ronnie del Carmen from pixar pixar now with netflix you know um anthony francisco with marvel studios he designed group mm -hmm. you know there 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 have been filipinos all throughout entertainment history the original transformers were designed by a filipino you know, but we just didn't know it was they were Filipino artists. Now we're we're beginning to um, get recognized as such, and I do whatever I can to not only take those guys along and and plug them into my network and help them meet the right people and stuff. Um, but uh, you know, uh, I do what I can. I I, I try. Well, you you've done a lot for the last. Uh... 20 plus years, clearly, yeah, I, I think it sounds like, um, you know, another question, and I was going to talk about this a little bit, just to let everybody know, because I've saw some people talking about like where to buy your original art, they were referencing some Google searches, I think maybe your old site, but I know that Joe keeps a calf gallery, um, pretty, uh, pretty up to date with artwork that's available for sale. And it, it is actually in the show description for anybody who was curious about, you know, where to, where to contact Wills through, uh, through Joe, and you can, uh, inquire about art that's on calf. I can post it in the chat so people have it. But one one question that came up earlier, and I, I'm not going to highlight it, but they were asking, when will the bishop artwork be made available? That you know, the, for these these this two story arc, is that something that's ever going to you know be released? Or is it uh, you know will, will it will it get to market at some point? Um, yes, I, I'm I'm you know I'd like to go back to another question um, yeah, because on. you you. You have to know how to. You have to know when to let go mm -hmm. oh, yeah. of something. Um, you're not. You're. You're almost never, especially in the first like ten years, never really, really satisfied with mm -hmm. anything because you know what it could have looked like, and but everybody likes it because because they have nothing else to compare it to, right? They they yeah. only have what it they is. Said that earlier, yeah. You know, they don't know what mistakes happened. They don't know what changes came in. You know, they don't know that you know you originally wanted something, but it couldn't. It couldn't get approved and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but um, when we did image, the real reason I I left Marvel at the height to to do image was not only it, they were my friends, Jim and Scott were part of were going to be part of image. I didn't really yet know the rest of the guys, um, but those last year, two years at Marvel. And we were the upper deck, right? Yeah. Jim and I and Todd and everybody. And we 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 knew each other professional and we were all young Turks. We knew at least we were young Turks. We were all experimenting, right? And we had our George Lucas moment. One of George Lucas's real accomplishments accomplishments is understanding ancillary, understanding toys, understanding marketing, mm -hmm. understanding branding, understanding that, you know. Well, Hollywood accountants could, you know, you can get your cut after, 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 and maybe not get a cut, you know, after, after, after. But if you if you handle ancillaries, that's a naked thing. So that's why Hollywood is so crazy now. That's why they've latched onto us, because not only can you make money, profit off of the ownership, 
but now off of ancillaries. And so we started noticing ancillaries in comics. We started noticing going to convent San Diego and seeing all these kids with our t-shirts. And they weren't Marvel t-shirts, but they were of good quality. And there were like multiple X-Men ones of mine, multiple X-Men ones of Jim. And to make a long, take a long story short, there was research done and we found that this company was make a million bucks basically. And we weren't getting any. And Marvel at that time had different priorities. Um, to not go into detail, but we actually got our cut of the t-shirts and it was like 36 bucks. And so, you know, us young Turks, you know, we're going, huh. Right. You're creating this fandom base that, you know, they've, people are wearing your artwork on their shirt, on their chests. Yeah. You know, and we were making shows and, we were and, uh, and you're not getting a piece of that. And that was how they showed their pride in, uh, in, in the, in the, in Marvel. Yeah. And, the yeah, and, 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 and we were making, wow. we were making good money off of the royalties, but then mm -hmm. we found out that the royalties were a percent off of a percent. So how much was Marvel making? Right. And so we, in a left hand way, figured out how the industry actually ran. And it, it, the biggest thing that really helped us, because again, we were just punk kids who had some money at the time. We were, we were kind of upper middle or lower high at that point, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, back then, if you, if you earned 2000 a month, you could buy a house easy, no problem, you know? But we started to understand then that, okay, we draw the comic book, Marvel produces it, then it gets sip, shipped to Cuba Corp to get printed. That gets sent to the distributor. The distributor distributes that to the retailers. And then only then does money come in from the customers. Mm -hmm. And only then does the money get split out. So everything else is done on credit. Marvel doesn't pay Cuba Corp. Marvel doesn't pay the distributor. It all happens back in. So we figured out, even us young punks, as long as we could draw it, and then through John Nee and Klein Dean, produce a negative, we can, we can, we can get paid the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> any output from us. And then Brian and I figured out that because we were taking Photoshop and using 2.7 million colors, but it was only 4,096 colors because it was, remember the old cut flat color, okay? And that was a long process. So they had to pay a cutter to do that off of Chido's guides. But they printed Time Magazine and stuff, full color magazine. So we go, okay, now we can give you a full color ma uh, um, negative how much extra is it going to cost us for a high end resolution print? And they go, what are you talking about? The printers cost so much. We can't afford to have a low end printer and a high end printer. Your comics are printed on the same. We're you just, just printing like a that. low end red, <laughs> uh, negative. Right. So we, we didn't have our budget pumped up because they just gave us the same rate. And again, on credit, we right. just gave them a higher end negative. So you're, yeah, so you're producing those, high, much higher quality on, for the same cost. So, so that, those, that answered somebody else. I mean, Gil had the a question as well. He said, who convinced you to leave Marvel and how difficult was that decision? I mean, it sounds like at the time it wasn't a hard decision at all. And it, you really, you convinced yourself when you really looked at the business aspect of, of how things were being done. Yeah, because uh, to, to pick it off of the T-shirt the part, we started seeing posters. We started, seeing, again, them. Uh, you guys demanding the animation and toys and stuff like this. And we brought those thoughts to Marvel and basically uh, we did it before, but uh, it, it's, it. but then we were watching star Wars and we were buying those toys and we we're going, Hmm, they're missing out on something. And so we got to get into the position where we make all the, the decisions mm -hmm. and it just worked out. And so, the the artistically the thing I'm most proud of is wet works because I was able to do that with no filter at all. I didn't have to get it anything approved. I did anything and everything I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it there. And and that's that then 
fit a little bit into Marvel when we did Jim and I did Heroes Reborn. Mm -hmm. Because that is that's where I honed everything I did in wet work because now it was free. Every, all that design stuff, all that storytelling stuff that I, I pulled from film and was free to do in like like you guys don't know this, but you guys loved the hatch uh, throw light style of the X-Men. Well, Jim and I were forced. Remember, Jim and I came from Punisher, full shadows. Right. We were forced to have to throw in an extra light because it was dictated from uh, to us that the audience wouldn't like full shadows. So we always had to brighten things up. That style I was then able to, in wet works, do to its fullest. And I honed it in wet works. And so when you look at that small little blip of, of Heroes Reborn that I did, that is the culmination of all my theories, all my uh, visual thoughts. And that's why it's so graphic. It's so um, uh, fundamental there. Well, a good question here from Henry, too, is uh, speaking of Wetworks, is what was the influence for Wetworks? I mean, how did that come about? I mean, I know it, somewhat maybe the military background, I mean, that you had, but um, what other things that were going on, you know, around you at that time, uh, you know, influenced the, uh, the birth of that book? Well, um, I had, uh, even though I was a mil Navy brat and um, Team Six was, was well, most Navy SEALs are, are brought in and trained and take their test at, um, at, at, at Coronado in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Um, I also had a very, very close relative and she was married to a captain from one of the SEAL teams, which where he retired and all the SEALs retire young because I mean, it's a dead dangerous place. And, and if you survive to like your mid twenties, that's like, you're an old man. So he retired and started doing Pentagon work and then and I would see him at the Christmas parties every year. Real clean cut, nice, pretty guy. You would not think he was, you know, spec ops. Um, the big thing for that Christmas was that the Pentagon was asking him to get to be recalled with about 300 other SEALs. And that was the formation of C, uh, Team Seal Six. They were brought in. They were built specifically to take out Bin Laden. But of course, he couldn't tell me all this stuff. And so the only thing that we could talk about were how the seals were set up. So even when the the seal movie with uh, Charlie Sheen came out, mm -hmm. you know, how, remember that was an introduction of God, right? The sniper. That was the introduction of these small assassin teams, right? Well, he was telling me about that setup way before that. And so since I was a military guy and Brandon Choi, who brought in as a writer, who was Jim's best friend, so he was writing Wildcats. And so we became friends and I asked him to help me co-write um, Wetworks. He was the one who came in with Wetworks. I didn't know that was code for blood work mm -hmm. in, in, in the SEALs. And it turned out he had aspirations to join the SEALs. And so we connected there. And then so we go, okay, what can we do with this? And we had these military thoughts and blah, blah, blah. And then I went back to my captain friend at Christmas and I asked him, what, what would Navy, I mean, it's Christmas. What would a spec op guy want for Christmas? I mean, not something that's there, but something that you really would like that would help you in the field. And they said, armor that moved with us. And Terminator 2 just came out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so, yeah, we just put all that together. And then Brandon goes, hey, Universal Monsters, they're public domain now. Vampires and werewolves. Good. We got a villain. Because at that time, that was the beginning of this, you know, I forget what it's called, but you know, oh, you can't make the Russians bad because they're not good Russians. Can't make the Japanese that's racist, you know. Right. You know, so here, uh, I mean, monsters. Yeah, they're always bad. <laughs> yeah. So again, that was again just pulling different things 
and putting it together and then making up a real world for that with real rules and then going with that. Not very cool. Uh, I think I saw this question earlier by the, the Vasic as well. It says, Will, so I really love that different art style you were doing for Stormwatch and uh, what influenced you in approaching that different style of art. Now that was a couple years after the coma, right? But so did the coma have any effect on your, your drawing style at that point or were you, were you going for something a little different? Um, at that point, I was starting to realize stamina and fatigue were a real problem for me. Mm -hmm. um, my style, especially before the coma, was got, had gotten to the point of extreme detail and extreme shading. That takes a lot of time. And so I could still do that. But after one or two panels, my brain then would race again. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing I, the next panel then would be, you know, so then I started getting into anime and originally, like I said earlier, I bought my first computer in Amiga 2000 um, in the late eighties, because it was the first desktop way before Mac that actually did ray tracing in a program called silver. And then mm -hmm. later on uh, when you bought the toaster, which was a, editing thing on board in the wrong it had light wave on it and so i i started doing ray tracing and especially earlier ray tracing is kind of like flat shade you know um cartoon and so i go what if i did outline drawings which is basically anime outline drawings and then all the complexity is in the shading Okay, so Alex Sinclair was the top dog guy at the time, and he was our guy. And so we, and we were really close because he helped me build the, the color studio. I go, all right, I'll do three issues of the color because I just bought the first, um, now it's called a Cintiq display. Yep. The first thing, but you got to buy a computer. But the first thing was a Sony Vio which came with its own computer. So you didn't have to spec up to that. You, you just bought it all. So I just bought that. So I was one of the very first ones actually drawing on the screen. And that's where that art style, the coloring style came out. If, if you look at it, it's actually a drawn style. It's not about blends and capturing, lassoing shapes and, and, and you know, doing thing, uh, filters on it. It's just straight drawing and breaking down the color shades into distinct groups like anime. Mm -hmm. um, but because I'm an anatomy guy, um, a lot of anime, especially back then, was very stylistic, was made up. A lot of it was just made up and just was cool. But I could pair it with realism. And then I had Chido to guide me on um, actual light theory and stuff like that. And so I go, OK, what if I? draw the outline of this, but then I color the first three and Ben is there watching and learning, then he could take off from there. And that was the that was the original plan. Unfortunately, with the second by the time the second issue came around, they they were making the DC deal and and Jim was locked down onto a contract uh, exclusive. Scott was locked down and also Sinclair. And so there was he was not going to be allowed to do that, but we had spent months already <laughs> studying this and we were already in production. We were already about to put out number two. And so it floundered there with my lack of stamina not being able to keep up there and not being able to bring anybody else up to speed because it's a totally new style and you needed a Cintiq or Vaya, which at the time we were still using the, you know, the, the pads. And then nobody in the studio except me had were it were drawing on the screen. Right. I mean, that was uh, like one of the first all-in-one computers, right? Where it had like everything built into the monitor or something. I mean, those files. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of things I did in Wildstorm. Covers for other people. I colored a lot of Carlos' stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, some of Jim's stuff. I, I actually even did a 3D bumper of Wildstorm because we were talking to Nelvana and we might need a bumper for it and stuff like that. So I was doing a lot of things on those machines back then, um, which was a precursor to where we were really gonna go with the studio. 
if the DC deal didn't work out. We were going to actually branch out to be a, a big, full-blown production studio because uh, Sky Blue was there in San Diego at the time, and we were visiting them and talking with them. But, you know, things went the way they went. But that uh, that's where I'm, I'm the most comfortable. In, in, in I get bored easy. So I want to see what's next. I want to see what ne what's next. And I think animation, I won't give you specifics, but if you can imagine animation, animatics in full illustrative finish, I think that is where anim the animation is going. Because it's animatics, it, cut down, it cuts down time. But since it's full illustration, that's where comics could go to. Because that is the comics is not biff bam boom. Comics is not even the panels. That's just we have to have pages. We have pages. We have to have a story. We can't do kinetic. It, it, it has to be static. What comics really is, and its distinction among all the other mediums, it's an illustrative style, right? Mm -hmm. Come on, tell me, Bill. How do you read a comic book? <laughs> oh, wow, that's cool. And then. Right, it's an illustrative style, and we look for Easter eggs, and we look at the detail of, of the art and the style. Now, even in a high-end Transformer movie done by Weta or ILM, when you see Optimus fighting the villain and doing a, a role or blah, 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 even if you have the DVD and you freeze frame it, there's something called motion blur, <laughs> or you really can't freeze frame it. But illustration, imagine an animation that's made like an animatic, and you can freeze frame and get the full fidelity of that illustration. I think that's going to be um, the future of, of, of animation, because then that could be done where you don't have to wait three or four years. You could do something almost monthly. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> Uh, question from uh, Stanley. Curious. I mean, do you collect original art at all? I mean, just any any pieces that you've picked up along your journey in comics? Here, here's where I'm really unique. No. Uh, it, well, you know, I've I've heard that before. Some you know, some guys maybe just pick up a piece they trade with with another artist because they want something of yours. But uh, so you, so you don't have uh, the same like an attachment to see you know to the media. Well, there, there are two things. Way. Okay, there are two things. I met Scott in high school. In right, uh, I did want to mention that too. Yeah, you've known Scott since you were both in high school. So I mean, yeah, that's amazing. Since I, was that a, you since I was a freshman and he was a senior. Um, so we met in art class in high school because after, I didn't know this, but art class in high school back then in Hawaii was structured where there was only really a um, a freshman art class, and then there's a senior art class. So you were only really supposed to take it first year or fourth year. But after first year, since sixth grade, all my art teachers took me under their wing. And so uh, the first year in my second, they made up a second year for me and put me into Scott's senior class. And, and we made friends. And so the first thing was that even back then in high school, Scott was collecting high-end stuff. I got to see real Barry Windsor Smith, real Kaluta. I mean, real stuff, right? So even though I loved all that, I didn't have that itch to collect it because I just go to Scott's house, right? <laughs> now, I have interviewed um, Scott. Yeah, just, and we didn't talk about him as an artist at all. All we talked about was his art collection because you know, he could talk for days. He's got such an amazing art collection. Well, he was one of the rich. I mean, did you guys... Spock onto that. I didn't notice until talking to him and like Higashi and some other collectors was that they're the big collectors because back in those days when, you know, you could get a Jack Kirby for like 20, 40 bucks, mm -hmm. right? Um, they were just people, they were the only people interested in comics and actually had some money. And so they were able to buy all that stuff. And then as it accumulated, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, worth and the prices went up 
you know. But anyways, so there was that, and I didn't have to worry about that. But see, I'm also a different artist, and I've never idolized artists. Um, I've always been a sponge. So like when I got into comics because of Scott there and him introducing me to comics, I started collecting because at that time it was Jack Kirby and Neil Adams were the top dogs. And so, well, on a regular basis, I mean, there still was Gene Colin and some other people, but you you weren't regularly seeing them. And Jack was doing like four or five books right. and Neil was doing his books, but he was doing almost every other cover for DC at, the, at that point. And so if I bought a Neil Adams comic book that day, I, there, was, I, there was nothing I could do except draw like Neil Adams. And then the next day, if I bought a Jack Kirby Eternals or something, I couldn't help it. I, I, I only drew like Jack Kirby at, at, at that moment. And so I realized I was a sponge. And again, being an analytical brain, I was going, if I really idolized artists like this, I'm going to be stuck. One day I'll do this, one day I'll do that. And, and I could do it really well. And I was really fluent in, in sponging stuff up. I mean, back then, I could just look at something and it's seared in my brain. It was almost photographic memory. I could just look at it and phew. I then went consciously went on the bent of, okay, here's Bill Senkovich. Oh my God, what the hell is he doing? This is, this is unheard of. You know, um, Neil came from the illustrative world and he brought in the pen and quill line work. But Bill was like using nails and cotton swabs <laughs> and, and, right. you know, and just being expressful with it. So what I did first unconsciously, but then consciously after that is I would buy Bill stuff and just zoom over new, you know, New Mutants, and I would pull and extract anything I could. Once I pulled and extracted anything I could, then I would literally throw away New Mutants and now start going to uh, um, Beasley mm -hmm. and, and looking through Judge Dredd. And then once I pulled out what I could from there, then I, I, that's how I kept going forward. And that's how I kept going fast by just absorbing because when when you get into idolizing it's very easy to go oh because you try and uh you try and uh you try and then uh oh, there's no way i mean bill's bill's god there's no way i can be as good as bill and so you kind of unconsciously push yourself down a little mm -hmm. and you don't try as much and so i've always disposed of my influences and always just sponge them up. So that went to artwork too. Right. I, I, you just I said never had an interest to collect it. That's yeah. Yeah. Because it's already here. Mm -hmm. I carried it here. So I didn't need to have, you know, you know, and again, I was Asian. I didn't need to spend my money because I needed to spend my money on a house and you know, starting up a family. You got to have those priorities in line. Yeah. 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 Jordan wanted to know if you went to uh, Radford High School. Yeah, I'm a Ram. There you go. Jordan's uh, in Hawaii as well. I uh, the year, the year after I left, that was when they got, he might know this. The year after I left, that's when they got um, uh, metal detectors. When I went to school, there were no metal detectors, and we were like, we were. I mean, it was it was like it was the '70s. Everybody was doing drugs or weed or. Or, or 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 LSD or stuff. I didn't do any of that stuff, but that's another secret. I never got bothered. Everybody would always get bothered. You know, hey, you got to go with the crowd. You got to assimilate. Blah blah blah. Uh, you're square. You know, that was you know the remnants of the of the sixties. I never got bothered because see, I've got um, what are these called? Uh, when my when my when my glasses are on the sun, they turn they they turn. Um, into sunglasses. They right. turn, turn, turn uh, progressive. Progressive, yeah. I have sensitive eyes. So when I'm out in the sun, my eyes turn red. And back then I was a kid and trying to be cool to get the girls to notice me and no girls noticed me, but I was wearing contacts. So that just irritated my eyes. And so I was this skinny, lanky, kinky haired, dark black kid. 
um, with red eyes all the time. And so the conversation was, hey, you know, what about Will? So he's, oh, he already probably has his own stash. <laughs> That's so right. They're all red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, J Jordan said he's a Ram class of 83. Oh, wow. So that would have wow. been close to you, right? I mean, you would have been 81, 82, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or thereabouts, I think. I was class yeah, of 80, I, I think. left in 79. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that, that I I I loved those those days. We were we were we were ah, there. We could, I could go on for hours. It was it was a it was a great place to grow up. I mean, it was like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You know, but you know, if you really watch Fast Times, on the surface, it's that Fast Times and stuff. But everybody really is. I mean, even the Phoebe Cates character, she really just wanted to be a real person. You know, she went with the role because, you know, hey, I'm pretty and everybody thinks I'm hot, you know, but, you know, well, but anyways, but yeah, th those are great times. And and Scott, um, uh, this guy will know, um, Scott lived in Air Force housing, which was actually across the street. So Scott never had to have a car to drive. He usually had, had a car. He didn't have to because his dad was an officer in the, in the Air Force, but he could just walk across the street and, and get to school. I had to be bust. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me. I remember Scott telling me that he got into comics when uh, he, he when his dad moved to a new base or something, and there was a box of comics left there by the previous uh, you know person in that uh, barracks or area or whatever. And so that's that that was his first exposure to comics. He, you know, he didn't. You know, I thought that was kind of cool. As his everybody has their different way of discovering books, but his was just a, a box of comics left. Uh, <gasps> I don't remember ever him telling me that because because it's funny because I, I, the exact same thing happened to me. Oh wow! I, I, I was in we were in Navy housing in Midway Island, which is just a tiny bit of an island where everybody knew everybody because there was only like thirty families there, so all the kids knew each other, and so and and they were complexes. So there was I think three or four stuck together and then three or four you know so we were in the corner one and so the middle one the next door there was this this black guy and his filipino wife and one day she came over as i came home and she goes hey you like comics i go yeah oh here if you want some comics you just just go get grab whatever you want and there was a box of comics and they were all like Neil Adams, Jack Kirby, Steranko, Gene Colan, all the good stuff. That night, to cut the story, story short, I hear this huge argument through the walls. <laughs> it turns out he really was a real collector. And this was a surprise. <laughs> and she just, just gave the him all away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that that. If I, did, I, I could think back, if I didn't have that first introduction, because I, were, I was already bitten by the science fiction bug. Mm -hmm. So there was no way a regular comic book could match up to that. But to be my first introduction, to be Jack Kirby's and Neil Adams and Steranko's and um, Gene Colan's, uh, you know, I, I was I was hooked. I, I, I told you earlier, I had, I re had real ambitions to be a film director, but I couldn't afford UCLA. And then San Diego Con, so I went there and I was offered a job and I took that. I'm now, for the first two years, I, I was just looking at comics as, as as a way to pay the bills. Hey, I, I could earn some money and I was earning more money than my 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 typical friend, my friends at the time. So I was kind of, you know, higher stature in, in the eyes of my peers. Um, but now I'm glad it went that way because I know enough about Hollywood that 50 to 75 percent of the game is getting people to give you money to actually do the movie you know and mm -hmm. i'm not a wheeler dealer i'm a pure creative i think of what i want to do work it out figure out the technical side and just do it and the only place that, that can happen is comics you know the only i mean by the time we were through with with x-men and went on to image bob harris allowed jim and i to come up with our own storylines i mean because again we had proved it already with an audience and with sales and mm -hmm. and our our artwork and 
and how we would take whatever story he gave us and then just blow it up. You know, he gave us that freedom, but very few people have had that freedom back then and even till to today. But it was again, because me and Jim could absorb like that. And, and that's one of the real things. It, 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 uh, the whole stereotype for any kind of creative form is just do whatever the hell you want. Well, you know, even an Elvis or a Ma Madonna a year earlier or a year after, not the same impact. Right. That's very true. Before that, it's like, what the hell is this? The year after that, been there, done that. Yeah, there's a comment here. Most people aren't going to see it because they are not, not on Facebook. But uh, Gary mentioned, I drove Wills and uh, Jim Lee around oh, Hawaii yeah. on our oh. Punisher tour. <laughs> See, he was part of Comics Hawaii. Uh, tell me, Gary, if I got that. Comics Illustrator Collector Society. So Scott had joined their group, and so every time we went to San Diego, they would all come to Hawaii, to San Diego together. And so Scott would shack up with them, and then I would hitch along and shack up with them because they get hotels. And then one of the main reasons we shacked up with them, they were one of the first people that could afford because they were in the professionalized, they were one of the first people that could buy $75 laser discs and they would buy all of the top, top stuff, you know? And so in the hotel after cons, they would bring a player and we would all watch it. And, you know, things like Wings of Oniyama, Smacross and stuff. And then they would translate it for us because <laughs> they were oh, Japanese. Uh -huh. Yeah. He was in the Hawaii State Comic Collectors Club. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Ah, those were the days. <laughs> so, uh, how about you know? There's a lot of other you know questions about uh, characters and things that you worked on and 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 whatnot. But and we've been doing this for a little while. I, I had a, I had one I had one thing I wanted to ask you about because I, I saw this uh, just right before the show. This this Comic Pro Boot Camp that you're working on this educational platform. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that? I mean, I I wasn't aware of it at all until uh, just before the show started. Um, it's uh, a group of wild stormers, mm -hmm. um, Ryan Benjamin, um, Carlos Deanza, um, uh, Alex and Claire, um, Ben, um, and myself. And um, that those those the other people in the group, they were the first wave and top tier of the second generation of wild storm, and so. It was this place where Chida was teaching, I was teaching, Jim was teaching, well, really mentoring on the spot, on, on the job. And so we all we all grew up with that mentality. And we all agree, even Jim, that the studio environment really jump started us. Jim and I would have gotten to where we got, but without the studio and being challenged by other artists and learning other things from other artists, um, it, it would have taken a lot longer. And so a couple of years ago, we we got together and wanted to give back by doing boot camps. But we wanted, we called it boot camp, but we, we, we didn't want, again, because of the environment we're in, where you were dropped into the fire, you know, you can't have, you can't coddle artists. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, get this, you know, we go, all of us Wildstormers and all of us image guys, we go, we go to like ILM, Weta, we go to Electronic Arts, DreamWorks, uh, um, you know, all, all these high-end places that do other media. And they all wish they could do comics. And these are name names. These are established professionals in their field. And the only reason that they couldn't do comics is they couldn't handle the four week load, you know? And so boot camp is, I mean, like we had this running joke, you know, uh, Ryan, you know, me and um, the other guys act as the good cop. Ryan is the bad cop, but see, he's the energy guy. He's got, if you ever met Ryan, he's got tons of energy. And so the joke is he's got this eraser. And he will go up to anybody's work and erase it and do it right. <laughs> and, because that's how we learn. Yeah. Because there was no time for Jim and I to go, okay, well, you know, put tracing paper. You should do it kind of like this and stuff. And then for them to, 
because see, you're precious with your own stuff. So even if we redraw it on a on a, a, a acetate or something, you kind of incrementally change it, you mm -hmm. know. And so the only way to really do that is to totally erase and then do a, a quick but tight lay layout, and then them finishing that. And so we uh, we we do we have high end classes. But we also have um, beginner classes, intermediary care classes, because everybody, especially, you know, contrasted to the days that, that Jim and I got into it and when Ryan and, and Carlos got into it, um, everybody now wants to be an artist or a writer. Um, but we don't want to coddle anybody because... I mean, like like in the Philippines, I, I discovered Lynn Neal Yu, Jay Anacleto, um, Philip Tan, you know, because they had a school there. Not only had a studio, but we actually had a school in, mm -hmm. in the largest mall in the Philippines called Mega Mall. You know, so we had full visibility and I was connected to a college. I was an alumni of one of the big universities back then. So we had full exposure. And so I was able to gobble up all of the best aspiring artists, train them in the school, bring them into the studio for advanced training, and then get them into, into the field. And again, it was all, it was all boot camp style because I had a couple, I won't name them, but there was about three guys that were rich kids and they were really good. Lenil Yu is my best known student, but there were a couple of guys that were just amazing. But they were rich kids and they didn't have to work. And so they grew up like rich kids. And so whereas Neil would, I would say, Neil jumped 20 feet and he would jump 20 feet. The rich kids would go uh, and argue with me. <laughs> about can I do one foot, maybe two centimeters. I mean, is it it's just the effort, right? You know, it's like, and so, uh, yeah, if, if you're gonna, re, if you really wanna make it in comics, you really have to be thrown into the fire because you're, it, then we say, you know, go be a concept designer, you know, <laughs> you know, not a knock on them, but you know, get into another field where you have a year to work because basically a two hour movie, two hour animation, the production on that, the design on that, the storytelling on that, the key art on that, that's what we do in four weeks. Right. In one issue. Now, it's always been a, a marvel to me you know, that you guys can get it done like that, you know, in that speed. And trust me, it's a, it's a, it's amazing. And like you said, there's so many hands in a project, the letter, the colorist, the writer, um, and you still have to get it past the editor. You know, there's just, it's amazing that, uh, that, that you can, you can meet those deadlines and, and we have for, for, for years, right? I mean, that's just the, that's the comics life cycle, but it's no wonder that, uh, Hollywood and other places are picking off, you know, creatives because, you know, they are so, you know, you're so skilled in comics and be able to, to push things through quickly. People wanting faster production cycles on things. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't surprise me that you know, the people look to comics creators and uh, people with your skill sets and, and want to like pull them over into their mediums. Well, well, one thing really interesting real quickly is that some people kind of fly through, over you know the Stan and Jack approach, mm -hmm. um, as is now called the Marvel way. Um, you know, a lot of people have the Hollywood mentality of, well, we're going to spend three hundred million, so we the story better, there be the best, and so we spend a year just massaging the story before we even start on any kind of production. Well, we don't have that time in comics, and so what the magic is is the magic of well-honed experienced professionals. So what the Stan Marvel, Stan and Jack Marvel style really is, is two guys at the time talking on the phone saying, what if we do this with the Fantastic Four and we bring in the Silver Surfer? And, you know, he's going to be like a herald to this new big, huge guy, Galactus. So we're going to go really upscale then, you know, really start introducing that. And then and then Jack goes, yeah, it wouldn't be kind of cool if, you know, he had this or that. And then Stan told me he came up. Jack was a guy who came up the surfboard and, and Stan goes, 
what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> well, but then you got to remember the context of the times. It was the 60s. That's when surf was starting to be this big thing with bodybuilding. It was a new, new, cool thing. And Stan, but Stan couldn't see it. And he told me that um, when Jack did the first drawing, Stan goes, yeah, that's actually really cool. And then, and then he said, Jack said, because Stan, if you notice his right, he likes double letters. Right, silver surfer. Mm -hmm. He goes, You don't like the surfer idea, but if we make him silver, <laughs> silver <laughs> surfer. And then that's where Stan goes, Yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> but, anyways, the whole thing is they talk on the phone with these jet, like I said earlier, just in these generalities, not yeah. Jack going, Oh, yeah, I could do this with the surfboard and Galactus, oh, he could be this, you know, like, you know, and, and Jack and Stan didn't do that either. They talked in big blocks. Because they didn't have five million hours. Because again, this is just dial up. Just, just, I yeah. mean, it's, it's a landline, you know? It's, is Jack gonna be home? Is he gonna pick up? You know, is he, is he gonna be in the bathroom, you know? So they would talk and go, yeah, 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 yeah. Hang up the phone. Jack would draw what he remembered. <laughs> Stan would get it. And instead of bitching that Jack forgot about this, or Jack remembered this the wrong way, his job was to write the script so that it looked like that's what they both agreed to do. <laughs> and that is the beauty of that quick style. Because that's the only way to do things on the fly. You go to an old writer's room in the beginning of TV or movie, and that's how it was. A couple writers in there going, uh, let's do a Frankenstein thing. And, you know, yeah, but, you know, everybody loved the Frankenstein. Yeah, we made a lot of money, producer goes. Yeah, so what are we going to do next? Uh, I don't know, you know, but, you know, uh, you know, and then somebody jokes, what about giving him a bride? And then the producer going, about to say, what the hell am I paying? For? And then one of the other writers goes, well, if we do it like this and like that, adding in other elements that he knows that's happening in in, in in the society at that time and making it connected. Then the person goes, yeah, yeah, that's it. Doing everything on the fly. None of it is, is writers going, oh, well, I've got this thing that I've been working on for 10 years and let me send everybody the, the full script. It's 100 pages or 120 pages for, for moving. No, no, it's this on the fly. And guess what happened to 90% of those writers in the writer's room, writers for Bob Hope, writers for, you know, uh, uh, like Citizen Kane and, and all those movies for Selznick and stuff like that. They all became the writers of the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. the guys who made millions of bucks, the guys who did MASH, the guys who did All in the Family, the guys who did Jeffersons. That's where they honed it. And if you look at all that stuff, MASH, All in the Family, all that, guess what that is? What's the sign of the times? What's happening in society? Okay. Let me let me tackle that from a human standpoint that right. everybody will understand. Let me all in the family. Let me talk about real things that is just messing up society because everybody's going at each other. But let me do it so that everybody can hear each other's side. You get that and you hone that from doing other people's stuff and doing it like that. And that's what comics is. And I will give you maybe 80 to 90% of the writers that are known in comics, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's what we were trained to do. Because when you, just like Conan and Bishop, if you couldn't do that, you died. <laughs> <laughs> if you survived and you, if you're a name right now, it's because you could do it. Well, it's it's, it's an amazing medium. It really is. I mean, yeah. I've I've loved it. You know, since I was a kid, and I'm more amazed at it today than uh, you know than than ever. Just at the. Uh, yeah, the, the whole process that goes into making them, and I, well, think of Frank, a, a Frank Miller, a lanky British guy who's been sleeping on the park benches in Central Park, walking into the office and say, "What if Batman was psychotic, like a sh old Sean Connery, and we named him Dark Knight because to to show that he's in a dark place now? Imagine that." happening today that conversation the lawyers would instantly go uh we own batman the trademark is batman 
and we can't have them psychotic. I mean, th there's there's you know mental disorder stigmas there. We don't want to get you know, and and Sean Connery might have a problem with it. And <laughs> <laughs> See, it, it 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 really is the place where new things are birthed, and that is the real reason. I mean, you can knock Holly for for a lot of things that they openly do, but one mm -hmm. of the things they really do well is they understand and see what works. And they and that's one of the other reasons, underlying reasons why there are very few real screenwriters. It's only like the James Camerons or, or the Favreaux or you know the, the handful of directors that we can name, but they're all directors, right? So it's a twofer for Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the, reason, the real reason they're latched on to us is think of one of my favorite films, Gone with the Wind. That's Selznick pulling off this huge volume, reading through the hundreds of pages, getting sparked by it, then spending like a year or two telling friends like, hey, have you read, you know, do you know the Scarlet character? And, you know, let me describe this card. And if they reacted, hmm, it might work. Let me ask somebody else. And then after convincing himself that it could work, then trying to take a year and have convincing you know, Clark Gable to be Rhett Butler and then doing this huge year search looking for a Vivian Leigh and then trying to get the financing and then the production of it. Well, guess what happens now? The producer sends his assistant to the comic store every Wednesday, right? When there's a new hundred comic books, buy me the good things you think I'll like. And then you get, and they're all five, two minute reads, right? Huh? The Rock might like this. Send it to him. Quick. It's a visual medium. Yeah. <laughs> not real for me. And half the work is already done for you. Exactly. And it's, you don't, you don't have to storyboard it. You don't have to, have to yeah. write it. You've uh, pretty much got, you know, you're more than halfway there. Now you just need the money and uh, someone else's, uh, you know, direction to kind of pull something together. It's true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Uh, here, how about we end it on this one? Because it's you know, I think we could do another one of these. Well, so there's, there's, I, I had this whole list of notes and things, and I don't even, think <laughs> I, touched, I, t I touched on half of them, uh, and there were a lot of other questions. But you know, yeah, I, sure, Bill, I, sure, I had a sure. question for you. It's like, and it's from, and Randy has asked a few questions. I haven't pulled up any of them. So, uh, <laughs> so, so Randy wants hey, to Randy. know, Bill, your work in Longshot blew me away. How did you get that inky gig? Because it's iconic. I mean, and that really was one of the like maybe the second professional work that you had i mean it was very early um but how did that happen i mean and, and was that a challenge i mean you were looking at inking art adams at that point i mean scott was a co-inker part on it as well he was, a, he was my back he started as my background guy okay well he started as my okay blacks guy and then he goes well so i like i, I could do trees for you because trees are boring all the leaves especially art adams right so you know but anyways um it was one of those things again, you know, I, I'm always talking about going with the flow and, you know, I even, I, I try to teach my kids. It's, it's don't get fixated on something. You never know where anything is. I mean, we, us image guys, we started in the eighties, you know, I, I'd bring my Spider-Man checks cause there was Spider-Man printed all of our checks to mm -hmm. the bank and the, the pretty teller that I try to go up to and talk to, she just giggled. Right. Now you go up there with your Spider-Man checks, and especially during Christmas time, because then they'll do a Spider-Man with a Christmas hat, you know? Mm -hmm. You go up to the pretty teller now, and she'll talk with you, and then she'll bring her manager over, and the manager will ask for San Diego comp tickets. You know, it, it, back then, it was like nowhere. It, 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 it was it was some place to be, something to 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 get into. So getting, doing it and getting into it was because you wanted to do something, something else. And here I was, like I told you earlier, I wanted to get into film, but, you know, poor, poor Filipino kid can't, can't afford that, you know? And at the time, you know, it was Spielberg and them guys, <laughs> you know, as a graduation class when I would have been in there. And, um, but you know, again, like I said, my cousin, my big cousin brought me over and said, hey, there's that Con Comic-Con. And I was just lucky enough that all of the editors from Marvel were sent to Comic-Con that year. 
they're specifically looking for new people. And uh, uh, Carl Potts was there, and he was the only editor in the whole industry that would take a almost there. And he, he bugged me every few weeks to send new samples. Mm -hmm. He sent me material. He sent me the five C's to teach me storytelling. So he discovered me at that San Diego. And then I had this portfolio, a wrong portfolio that they tell you not to do. It was full of watercolors, illustrated, inked and watercolors, illustration, pinups. Um, it had one or two story things, a Hobbit story thing um, and a, uh, an X-Men story thing. But they could see I could ink and I could draw and I could color. And especially back then, and we didn't know it at the time, that was the real secret to get in because there's so few people there because I mean, it wasn't even considered a job. Everybody just assumed maybe computers or something made comics, you know? Nobody knew it was a real job and could you make any money off of it? And so when they found you that you could do multiple jobs then you're you, an asset at that point when you can do more. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So um, I got in there and I couldn't tell a story. That's why Carl sent me the five C's. It's a, it's an old film book that teach um, storytelling, films, visual storytelling. And so he would, he FedEx that to me and, and I studied that. Now, while I was studying that for the, I think it was like two months, three months while I was studying that, he would then call me, keep me bugging me and say, send me some samples. So show me that, you know, you're understanding this stuff. And then, he, and then he was happy with me. And then he goes, Hey, Will's want to make some money. Cause he was close with Anna mm -hmm. who was the X-Men editor who had just discovered art Adams and was writing long shot. And everybody in the industry passed on art Adams, every inker because he was too detailed. Right. Going to be work, <laughs> you know, and he was not, you know, like, I mean, uh, one of my idols is John DeSama, but, you know, he would do the old style of, you know, nice layout, but really tight. Right. But art, he was anal. <laughs> he did every leaf. So there was no room for wiggle. Right. And so you had to do that. So everybody passed him up. And I knew that happened because. I ex um, Bob, I mean, Carl goes, hey, I talked to Anne and she liked your samples and uh, she wants to know if you'd like to ink this new guy that she found. And they sent me Xeroxes and I go, yeah, sure. I mean, I just wanted to make money because here it was now two months and my parents were getting a little edgy because I'm not making any money. I don't have a real job. <laughs> so, okay, I can make some money. Okay. So I go, yes, without really understanding what I was getting into. So it was close to San Diego Con. So I go to San Diego Con. Anne is there. She introduces me to Art Adams. Now, Art Adams was this, like, for about a year before that, everybody was passing around Xeroxes in the industry of his stuff. So everybody knew that Adam Art was going to be the new king. He was that new young Turk, right? And so he's sitting there at Marvel tables, and I'm sitting next to him. And it's like royalty. It's like he's the queen, you know, <laughs> Harry Austin, um, uh, uh, Klaus Janssen. Everybody comes by and it's like, hey, Art, you know, and everybody goes, uh, how's Long Longshot coming around? And then he, he would point to me and go, I have an inker now. Every single inker would then turn to me and go, condolences, dude. <laughs> <laughs> because they knew how much work it would be. But I was uh -huh. really dumb, and I needed them to show my parents I could make some money. And so I quickly got it to be, because, again, I needed to. Uh, I, I was doing those pages at four hours a page. And then once that came <laughs> out and blew up like that, I couldn't get near Art Adams after Longshot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody had to ink Art Adams after that. But see, that's how I got into to long shot. It was just again, like like any other industry. Even 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 um, movies, concept design, even animation. It really still is a small community. So if you can rise above somehow, like here I was, I, I was already known as oh, he, this is going to be one of the pencilers, but he's now inking stuff. And lo, look, he's inking the new king. You know, and so, okay, now I was established as an inker, 
you know? And so like I was on everybody's radar now at that point. And since it was such a small community, it was everybody's radar. And so, oh yeah, there's a Punisher opening. Tried and not tested, had to just learn storytelling mm -hmm. last month. Okay, we'll give him a shot, you know? And then right after that, Hey, want to do some X Men? You know, it's it was a small community, and and that is, you got talent, and you and and, and you you work hard, and you do, you know, I hate I hate to generalize people, but there's too many people bitching about things, you know, Jim and I and Todd and Rob and everybody before was Big John Neil. It was just this is it. You're going to do it? No. Okay. I'll get somebody else. You're going to do it? Yeah. Okay. You know, middle of X-Men Uncanny 281. Create a new X-Men. Uh, I'm in the middle of 281. Create a new X-Men. Okay. I'll call you in two weeks. Uh, okay. <laughs> two weeks later, goes on. Uh, here's the pitch. <laughs> okay. Put them in. Okay. Never written anything. Never drew in. Uh, 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 uh plotted anything, never do, uh, created a character or anything. Just did it. Just just didn't complain and just just learned. Right. I think there's a lot of ego now. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to show I don't know a thing. It's a small community. People people are going to let you make those mistakes as long as you show the potential. Then people will let you figure it out. Right, as long as you're professional. Yeah. Right. I mean, being professional is a, is a, is a, is a big point. I mean, as well as being talented, but you know, if you have all those traits, you're going to, you're going to go far. And clearly that you were like, you just said, yes, I'll tackle anything that you throw at me. I'll figure it out. I mean, that's, uh, that's, you're, you're everything that they would have wanted, you know, at that point in time. Yeah. yeah because again, a lot of people will say that's scary, but what could have happened? Oh, uh, when, it, when Bob called back, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, Will's good try, and then you know he's going to pick up the phone and call John Bird and say, "Hey, John, what 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 do you think this basic mo you know, or, or do you have an idea, John? But I need it tomorrow." And, and if John was in that mood, he would have given him something. If not, then he would call out Chris. Then he would call up. He could call out. It was Bob Harris. He could call up anybody. Mm -hmm. But he gave me the first shot. You know, and hey, it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So take it. What's the worst that could happen? He could have said no. And then uh, I could have done image and that could have totally flopped and I could not. And because we were incremental in months, right? I was going to be one of the last, I was going to be the last month. So my book, it could have failed and my book not even come out. Right. Right. That's but, true. But guess what would happen? Okay. If Marvel was still pissed off and wouldn't take us back and DC being corporate going, oh, I don't know if we want to deal with that because they could jump ship at any time and they didn't take us. We would have gone to animation. We would have gone to movies, because what was happening at that time? That's the big burst of concept design at that point. Mm -hmm. So we would have fallen into that, because a lot of the people that they were gobbling up, they liked our stuff. They would have been they would have been telling their directors about us, and their bosses, and so we would have fallen into something else. It was it was just it was just the time, you know. We, yeah. There was no, there was no real fear, and again, you could have, you could fail, but that's so what. Then do something else. Right, you move on to the next thing. That's yeah. <laughs> I mean, like you say, because you're at the, you're at that point in your career where you, you know, if you have the confidence, so you can do that. But uh, but fortunately, everything continued to work out. You were able to stay in comics, and uh, and then well, create. Well, well, like, like here's okay, just a little bit about that confidence. Uh -huh. You get confidence with success. You know, like I could tell you stories of the personalities of image, us guys, us young kids in our 20s, in the beginning of image. What you see today, none of us were like that. We were young punks. We were the definition nerds. But with successes of what we did and people gobbling it up, companies relying on us because they were making money off of us, and then going to conventions and getting that 
input. Mm-hmm. See, this is a this is a thing that goes hand in hand with celebrity them in Hollywood. It's the same thing anywhere. What it is is because most young actors before they become big, it's the same thing with comics. Most young actors before they become big, they're shy people. You have to be shy. You have to internalize. I mean, there's that age-old story of Norma Jean, you know, being this shy country girl. But when the cameraman took pictures, she became Marilyn Monroe. But she was just a side person. And then through the rest of her career, she had to live up to Marilyn Monroe. But she was Norma Jean. And so we would go to conventions as these nerds, and that would connect with everybody. But then... They had, because of Wizard X, Wizard Magazine, they had expectations of who we were and how we were. And then Todd was the first one to figure out, oh, well, everybody thinks that I just babble and, 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 and I, 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 you know, I, I, I do, I, you know, but I, and then eventually I'll say something weird and, but and, you know, I'll embellish that. And, 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 you know, and he goes, that's what people expect. Because he didn't really do that back then. And then he just did that. And then the audience expected, and then the audience expected him to be one of the top dogs. So then he went into this persona of being a sophisticated, I, 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 you know, well, well, you know, and that is his persona now. Jim, the same way, you know, cigar token, you know, you know, big shot publisher, Rob, you know, Rob was the kid. <laughs> Rob was the kid. The only guy that had any kind of glamour was Mark, because he was tall, this tall, good-looking Italian guy. <laughs> he, he always had beautiful women with him, you know? So he, he already worked into that. But the rest of us were just kids that have worked into the... Like, if you go back in the time machine and you see all, all of us on stage, I won't say crap. Because I'm a logical guy. I got seven people in front of me and all six of... I mean, six people in front of me, all six of them are just regurgitating the same story. <laughs> Because the question is always the same. So uh, was it scary going from Marvel to, to Image? And then so Rob Dodd would go, rah, 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 and then Rob would go, well, you know, like, and then, and then Jim would go, well, you know. And, and then it's like. By the time they got to you, there was nothing left to tell. Yeah. So I just, <laughs> I, I'm just George Lucas here. I'm just, uh, I'm the tech guy. I, I just do things. And, and now people are flabbergasted that you can't stop me talking now. You know, but it's because I'm talking about the things I, you know, you know, that I know mm-hmm. the things that I can now teach. Because like I said earlier, with going to the Philippines and s- setting up that studio, I found a different, a different, you know, avenue for my energies, different thing I can do. Back in the day, I never thought about teaching. I never thought that I could teach anything that I could never, even though I had a logical brain, I didn't think I could make it make sense. But 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 now I do. And a lot of that, again, is just these conventions have really molded us. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's really made us into that. And that, again, with the story of how I realized my place in the Philippines, we now really understand, even though that's a persona, like 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 in, you know, like a celebrity persona. And that's not actually who you really are, but that's what the audience expects out of you. That helps I mean, a lot of people put branding in, in, in a bad context, but brand is another word for story. And that is all I really do. That's all we really do, story. If, if you take the Silver Surfer science fiction concepts and, and a scientist explain the Silver Surfer comic book, people would not remember anything he said. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Right. No, but you throw the visuals in there by Kirby and, and all of a sudden it, it makes sense and it makes you want to see more of it because it, it may have may have felt a little absurd at first, but it was fantastic. Yeah. And that's all story. Mm-hmm. And again, branding is just story. That's what Steve Jobs told us. That's what, you know, I don't really like Elon, but that's what Elon showing is showing us after learning, you know, uh, 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 from Steve Jobs. Remember, both of these guys didn't actually build any of this stuff. You know, it really wasn't their idea, but they saw that it could be. And they, and you know, Jobs made a computer which nobody wanted to buy because nobody wanted to learn it. He made it magic. 
He explained to you what it could do. You know, Bill Gates didn't have to because he's already making a billion every four months. <laughs> he, he didn't need to do that. But Apple was almost nowhere at that time. You know, and, and that's what he built. And that's what Elon built in. He remembered in the 60s when we had the space program, the NASA program, the Apollo program. I, like every other kid at the time, wanted to be an astronaut because it was the story of going out there and explore. It was the next step because, you know, you went from being John Wayne on that horse, <laughs> going into that <laughs> desert that you didn't know what was at the end of it, but figuring it out and, and uh, blood and guts, you know, surviving through that. We now know what the West is like. It's called California and it's got Hollywood now in it. So what's next? Up in space. Oh, I mean, we. I bought G.I. Joe spacemans. I bought Lego spacemen. I bought these things where you could melt these waxes and pour them into plastic molds to make your own spaceman toy soldiers and stuff. I think I remember those. <laughs> they never worked. They, they well, always started well, to dry crashed, up. Right? They, they kind of cracked, I think, all the time, right? <laughs> they never would keep their shape. They, they Yeah. Uh, that's but see, again, it's the branding. It's it's really yeah. the story. And that's what we're selling. Because think about it. There is no such thing as a superhero. There's no such thing as superpowers. And they probably never, ever will be. But why does the whole world now, why is the whole world now enthralled with superheroes? Here's the last thing I'll leave you with. Okay. This is how we write superheroes. The human brain works on a story. Like the reason we remember about those, I think it's four brothers who died and then the Pentagon didn't want the headlines of the fifth last brother dying. And we've now sent a fifth dear John letter to her grieving, his grieving mom, who has already grieved four times on the headlines. So we sent out a squad to bring him back. And then Spielberg does a movie of Tom Hanks about it. The reason remember that is because it's a story that is easily digested, that we can understand mom crying and not understand even the mean old Pentagon, them understanding that, oh, we don't want the bad press of that mom having to cry the fifth time. And so we're going to show that we really love being Americans and are, are, are faithful and, 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 and we honor our soldiers by going after this kid, bringing him home, making him a hero. That story, anything that's told in the story, that's why we remember the West. That's why we remember Truman Capote. That's why we remember the, the, the zoot suit period. That's why we remember anything. Because not because of the real details of it, because that bores people. But it, but it was spun and told in a way that we could connect. So now going back to how do then, how do I tell a story? Well, I take all those everyday stories that I know, that people know, without me telling them that they unconsciously know from everyday life. And I pile that together to tell a super fantastic story. So you take a guy born with a heart defect. Everybody could understand that, that if I was born with a heart defect, I'd do whatever I could to overcome that. Well, what if you're born a billionaire? Well, I'd spend all my money to try to, to, try to fix, you know, help, you know, fix that problem with me. Okay, what if you're a tech millionaire? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'd use my tech stuff to build maybe, oh, yeah, a tech heart or some tech to help my heart. Oh, okay, so now now that that tech is out there and everybody's going, oh, wow, the great leap in medical science. Now all these other people want it and they want to use it for bad things. Oh, now I got to build more tech to protect it. What if I build a suit? Oh, no. I could house it, keep it with me. Nobody can steal it because I'm in it. And the suit can help me protect the heart. Well, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. And that's just all these little everyday stories that pile together into, yeah, 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 to the punchline of, oh, now he's Iron Man. And that's how you write a superhero story. You don't write it with, oh, I got this great idea. And then just hope and and demand that everybody understand it. You look for the now, re relatable points and yeah, and drive that home. No, I, that's I, why the Spider Man thing had to be. You know, he didn't let that um, he let that criminal go by, because hey, I'm a nerd. Everybody treats me like I'm an idiot and invisible. So why am I going to help? So now that I can be on my own, why am I going to help a society? Well, 
stand in and goes, well, let's have them kill uncle. And now with great responsibility, I mean, great powers come great responsibility. Anybody can understand that. Anybody. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, but that's why, you know, those of us who have, uh, who gravitated the comics early or even, well, and now even later, you know, thanks to the movies, I think that's why we, we love it. I mean, it's something that, you know, I, who didn't want to be those characters or feel like you could, you know, you were friends with people who, who could uh, have been in those roles. I mean, that's what uh, I think. That's why I was always a Marvel guy over a, uh, <laughs> yeah. over a DC guy. I could never relate to DC stories, but the Marvel stuff, I, I it, it almost didn't matter. I, I, I it, it was all relatable. Yeah. Yeah. And now the whole world understands it. Imagine that different cultures, different languages can understand it because it's basic stories. Well, you know, and there's so many things more that we talk about because, you know, this kind of ties back to something you mentioned about an hour and a half ago. When you were <laughs> talking about how Filipinos have a inherent, uh, you know, art style, potentially. You know, Carl Jung would say that that's that's very, you know, of course you must. Right. Because it's, you know, it's a part of your, uh, you know, your 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 ancestry. It passes down through you. Doesn't matter if you were raised on the Hawaiian Islands and have no idea of your Filipino ancestry. I mean, that just happens naturally. So, uh, sorry, we, we, the thing, we'll, we, we, we do have to do this again. And it, and I do a, a message I have to pass to you because uh, Nicholas Greer sent me a little super chat. It says, Will's just got my Deathlock original art. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, we're gonna have to do this again. That we've hit the wait, wait, we're at three hours now, Wills. I mean, <laughs> I bet you didn't have dinner before we started talking. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I I had I had uh, diet soda. Okay. <laughs> oh, I had some I have some dried apricots. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no, no. I mean, you know, it, it's all about scheduling. You know, so yeah. So email Joe. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to talk with you again. Again, because this is what it's all about. Like I said earlier, when you asked how do we pass along this stuff, we don't have the time to, to talk when we're working. Right. I mean, my wife had to, had to get used to that, that when I'm in the zone, she can't bother me, even if the house is burning down. You know, it's I've got to follow this thread. I've got to follow this thread. And so to have moments like with the Comic Society coming to San Diego every year, or us meeting at at, at 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 conventions or other places, to have the time to be able to sit down and 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 talk about the things that you know we both enjoy, mm -hmm. um, because that is the template for the world now. It, 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 we've made it, we've made it okay to keep liking things. You know, it's true. It's very true. Absolutely. No, and it's. Uh, uh... And I agree. These these kind of conversations are important. I think. I mean, we've we've we've. There's so much of the uh, the things that have gone on in the business of of comics, and uh, that so these kind of these stories aren't don't get told too often. You know, when we, the things that we're talking about today, I've I, you know, for me, you know, I with since the pandemic, I've reinvented what what I did. You know, through I, you know, I've owned comic art fans were almost 20 years old uh, as a as a site, but when the pandemic rolled around, we kind of started doing these conversations and I realized wow there, there's so many stories out there that uh if we, you know if we don't talk about them now we're never they could be lost I mean and they're also important to what have uh you know it, that are a part of this hobby and we're coming at it for, as comic art collectors but we you know we are we all love comics at the core of what we uh you know of, of how we got involved in this as a hobby so um so though these stories are incredibly important I've loved every minute I mean I've gotten to talk with you know taken a few times i got to talk with neil adams a couple of times before he passed and every one of those were were enlightening one way or another i mean about the hobby about the the individual and and you know i i cherish every opportunity that we get to to do things like this i and i really appreciate that uh joe was able to work this out with us so that we could do this this evening well i i, I really really appreciate that 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 you and people like you do this because one of the things I'm envious for something Hollywood do, has done um, correctly is, do you remember, um, I think it was based off one of the big acting schools, but do you remember the, um, what did they call it? They called it the round tables where, you know, a Scorsese and Clint Eastwood and other top guys would be it together. And then they had that guy, I forget what his name was, but he was a historian. 
And so he knew a lot about or heard a lot about a lot of stuff. And so he didn't ask the typical questions. He asked underneath questions mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, uh, David Lean, uh, what was that line in the sand that pointed to Omar Sharif when he entered in his first scene? And, you know, you find out that the smoke behind him were trucks, but because of the desert distortion you couldn't see the trucks but you could see the smoke and that line was they actually put a line in there so that you could visually so to ask all those process questions i don't know about you but when i saw that yeah inside the actor's studio when i saw those things and heard those conversations about real process things and mm -hmm. how decisions were made film was more serious to me then Furious ser film was like an art process to me. It was art. It wasn't just a cup because remember the old, you know, even Charlie Chap Chaplin um, uh, put this out there, but it was again for proper for branding back then because nobody understood what film was. But back in the day, and and it lasted until the actor studio was. Oh yeah, it's just you know, hey, okay, now just move and then yeah, okay, jump. Yeah, I like that. Do jump again. You know, it's you know just on the spot. Yeah, you know, just a couple guys getting together, right? Mm -hmm. But when you saw the actor studio and you remember these great scenes and you remember and now you hear how some of it might not have happened. I mean, you probably heard the story of in the middle of shooting in Tantooine, a storm came in and destroyed everything. Mm -hmm. And George had already used up all the budget and he had to get Laddie to try to convince them to give him more budget. So Star Wars could have died that day. You know, to hear those stories and how Laddie uh, was was one of the real keystones for making this happen, or hearing the stories of of Coppola and Spielberg and Scorsese that you know um, uh, it was a time when corporate bought the studios, and so there were they were not creative bosses that owned them; they were just money people. And they didn't want to go to the old school, so they went to UCLA and grabbed all these new, new, new graduates like George Lucas and let them play around. Mm -hmm. You know, if if that didn't happen, if that wasn't happening, they would. I mean, a science fiction movie, and you want us to convince Alec Guinness to star in a kid show? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know. I think the more and more we can do th this stuff and find out real behind the scenes stuff, I think then it's easier than for us to translate to the bigger audience that this is an art form. There is thought and there is skill that goes into this, you know, and and you, ta you tail it with, well, see all the stuff you see in the movies? All the really big stuff that you remember, they were massaged a little, but all that is, let me show you some Jack Kirby, Iron Man, and the Hulk. Let me show you some Thor. Mm -hmm. Kind of looks, it's kind of, it's, it's a little modernized, but that's it. They didn't totally change it. Superman looks like Superman still, you know. It's, it's not, in this day and age, even back then, but especially now, you got to have a megaphone. You have to say, and it's funny to me growing up when I grew up, even in this day of internet, of the internet where you could just, and you have your phone with you every day and you just, oh, okay, what's this? Is it amazing how many times something happens or somebody says something and nobody Googles, <laughs> but they reply? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I could do a post saying, oh, I love using this pen. And then I will get, Two people saying, which pen do you use? You know, it's, it, it, we, we have to show people our passion and we have to show that it's real. We have to show that we think that we, we deliberately do this. And, and this is the opening. The whole world knows our creations. They don't know we do it. They right. don't know we do it. No, I, I agree. I agree, and uh, well, then through these these kinds of conversations, hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll enlighten a few people. But um, no, I mean, again, I, I've appreciate I appreciate doing these immensely, and it, it's it's given me new insight into into a hobby that I thought I already understood and had enough love for and appreciation for. 
but you know, and it's it's true. I I, I think every day I I learn something new that makes me appreciate it all the more. The creation process, just you know, the creators. I mean, you think about uh, it, it, it. It is an, an amazing hobby that doesn't stop right at the comic or at the at the the uh, at the at the movie theater. You know, it really goes beyond that, and it goes. It really comes back to creative people, like you say, who've given, who were given the opportunity to do something and weren't afraid of the challenge. So, uh, so again, we'll, I, we do have to do this again. I will talk with Joe. We'll try to work something Definitely. out. You know, I'm sure once uh, the, you know, do, are you, do you have like plans this year for to get to any any like cons, or do you, uh, or what? What's your schedule for the year like? Well, uh, my family has had a few medical. Problems. Let's just leave it at that. Some yep. major uh, mental problem. And and I'm what they call in the films. I'm Kuya. I'm I'm the big brother. Mm -hmm. So I've got to I've got to take care of everything. But we are planning for at least San Diego this year. Okay. And and maybe some of the international shows. But we're because again my health thing. You know we, we mm -hmm. again uh, I put it in the context that it's really stamina. You know, um, that uh, that's the thing that I have to really uh, worry about, because, I mean, you know, you pro you've flown to different places, too. And, you know, that's grueling flying and, and then doing the con, you know. And so I, I, I've got this routine now with my wife where and now my kids where they make sure I, you know, it's easy to forget to eat. Bad thing when you're diabetic, <laughs> you know, it's an easy thing to yes. totally exert yourself too much bad thing with a diabetic, you know, but we now have this plan. So I'm hoping we can open up uh, this year. But again, the first, the first thing is I've, I've got to take care of, I got to, I got to settle, I got to settle my father and, and his conditions. Um, because that's, that's, that's one of my roles. And, and, mm. and, and I've, I've always, I've always lived up to that for my, for my mom. And so I've I've got a I've got a I got a spearhead that I got to take care of that once that's settled because that because anybody that's gone through you can kind of guess what I I'm getting at but anybody that's gone through a, a one of you know your father or your mother going through major medical thing I mean he's 80 so you know you can guess what that's all about um, you know it's a big thing it, it, it's a big thing that rocks the status quo. Everything has to change and adjust for that, and and I'm just fortunate again to to kind of go back to everything you talked about. Uh, I have I have this career in life where I've adjusted to things, and so once I get that um, settled, then uh, yeah, I mean, me and my wife love the travel. We miss that so much. We miss meeting, um, uh, meeting up with everybody again. Um, uh, you know, you're right. It's been three years. Yeah, it's been three years. You know, I mean, I I remember people going through getting married, being single, getting married, getting divorced, having kids, and now I'm you know, I'm gonna go everywhere, and, and everybody's gonna have big kids. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of things can change in three years. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I yeah, you know, I you know, originally I wasn't planning on going to San Diego, but I may end up going this year. I was kind of thinking of, I went there last year, and I was thinking I'd only go to New York this year. What was I, what, what was the end? What was the end scoops on? Uh, uh, because remember, um, what was it? The Italian, the the Lake Show, right? Lake Como. Yeah, that was like a couple weeks after, and that was kind of bad. A lot of people got sick. Uh what was san diego remember. like I, san diego was i mean i think a lot of there were so i had friends that went that uh, came back with covid but i i mean i didn't fortunately but people that i was around were but we all had masks on so i think that probably helped i don't remember Com como is in uh mi middle of may so oh, it was, okay so it was before it, it was yeah. two months before san diego i don't i don't recall people saying that but there was there was yeah i had a lot of friends even on the plane back a lot okay. of pros Saying they 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 got sick. and that was well and those were really the first kind. Of, I mean, we went to I went to Heroes last year too, which was uh, middle of uh, June, and you know there were people that that I know that came back with COVID. Too. So it's it's kind of it's there, unfortunately. It'll probably yeah. still be there for for a while. You know, people still picking it up, but uh, at least fortunately in the states we haven't had a big outbreak of late. But it's still 
still lingering. I had it at the beginning of the of last year, so I had a year ago, but uh, but not from a con, from one of my kids going to an event that brought it back. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it is it is what it is. I uh, but yeah, so yeah, maybe I'll get to see it San Diego. But 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 I'll talk with Joe. I'd love to have you back on. We can talk some more. Yes, yes. Yeah, we can go through the rest of the pages. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, but again, everybody, you know, again, if you're interested in picking up anything from Will's, uh, uh, Joe Portasio has a gallery on CAF, and you can visit it anytime. You, you can uh, email her through the website, so you can uh, inquire about any of the pieces that are, are available for sale there, and uh, and they can take care of you if it's available. So. Uh, and ask questions through there as well. So I, I have the links in the description. And if you if you can't figure it out, you can always email me. And I'm through the site, bill at comicartfans.com. I can help you find it as well. Chido. See, Marcus is saying, say, <laughs> say it one more time, Bill. Chido. Yes, Marcus, I've got it. I'm not going to forget it. <laughs> uh, all right, Will. So you, you have a wonderful evening. And I, I look forward to getting to talk to you again sometime soon. Yeah, you, you too. Take care.